located on the landing and are also posted on our website. Today's meeting is being recorded internally for information purposes, but our streaming service is down, unfortunately. At this meeting, any person in the audience may speak to any item on the agenda for three minutes. Under agenda item five, I will be asking for comments from the audience. Please raise your hand at that time and indicate which agenda item you would wish to address. The maximum time allotted under this section is 30 minutes total with individual comments limited to three minutes. Your name will be included in the committee of the whole report and form part of the public record and posted to the county website. We request that you provide a written copy of your remarks to the clerk for the record. <clears throat> When you speak, please stand at the podium, turn on the microphone, and provide your full name and address and your comments to the chair. Following your deputation, there may be questions from members of the committee, so please remain at the podium to respond. Any motion made at this meeting is not final until the council meeting of August 13, 2019, at which time the council may approve, amend, defer, or otherwise change the motion made by this committee. You may attend the council meeting to see the final disposition of any item for today's agenda, and you may speak again at council, but you will be limited to three minutes unless you register first and are listed on the council agenda. The clerk's office can provide information and advice on this process. There is also a brochure on the landing and posted on our website with information for deputations. As a matter of housekeeping, in the event of an emergency to exit the building, Please use the stairs on the left and around the corner outside the door of this chamber or the stairs off the committee room. Do not use the elevator. Please turn off your cell phones or mute them. And with that done, we'll move on to the confirmation of the agenda. I'd like a motion, but I'd also like to add that we are removing item 4.4 because it has been canceled today. And I would like to ask committee to consider bringing forward item 6.7 to the beginning of items for consideration because Councillor Bolick has to leave early. So could I have a motion to confirm the agenda, please? Councillor Nyman, seconded by Councillor Bailey. All those in favor of the amended agenda, thank you. Moving on to disclosure of pecuniary interest and if any, the nature thereof. Seeing none, we will move on to item number four, deputations. Specifically number 4.1, a deputation by Patrick Maloney to address committee regarding the Millennium Trail upgrade project. Patrick. Oh, the red button, good, that works great. Oh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, Honorable Mayor members of council and the general public. My name is Patrick Maloney. I, I'm a chair of the uh, Prince Edward County Trails Committee and vice chair of the ad hoc committee uh, for the Millennium Trail upgrade. I'm going to try to make this as short as possible. Thought I, because we have some new members of council here, I thought I'd just a quick recap of the trail and the trail project. Um, as we all know, the Millennium Trail is a unique scenic route uh, along the abandoned uh, right of way that was purchased by the county in 1997, beginning in uh, Fort Kente Road uh, near Carrying Place, traveling roughly to the to the uh, Loyalist Parkway, crossing uh, Consigon Cons Lake through the wetlands near Hillier, continuing close to the centers of Wellington and Bloomfield, with termination points in Picton downtown at Lake Street, by the new LCBO, and north of Picton uh, to uh, Highway 49 near Chapel. Road. Um, just a quick map, probably the latest map that I have. We need a brand new one, but that just kind of maps it to the county. I think everybody familiar with where the county is and roughly where the uh, where the trail is. There is a. Um, uh, one of the items on that is that it kind of showed earlier that the trail was about 53 kilometers long, and it's actually less than that just because part of that was in Quinty West. That always may include it. So what was to be done? So the project for the, for the uh, Millennium Trail, the Prince Edward County Trails Committee, um, in tandem with the county, um, this is kind of a little historical document, uh, it was fundraising to resurface the remaining kilo uh, 38 kilometers of the trail that needed to be upgraded for general use. Uh, we used as a, as a basic, the, the design guidelines as the Wellington section was done by the Wellington Rotary Club. And some of the items that were done through this process was brushing out of overgrown edge areas, widening the trail to 11 feet, 
regrading the gravel and the stone base uh, and topping with six inches of crushed limestone, um, placing distant markers every kilometer and providing safety, interpretive and uh, directional signage. And I put down the bottom that uh, uh, as far as safety interpretive, um, that uh, also parking lots were included in it and, and there's been five to six that, are, that have been uh, designated um, and, uh, and you know, we'll leave it at that. Okay. So as far as the staging areas, which is really what I'm here to, to talk a little bit about, um, uh, we budgeted uh, for six staging areas about $7,000 per, um, per staging area in the budget because we had a very limited budget to start with and we, we designated that to be strictly done for um, allowed for putting some parking lot down. Uh, the staging areas were the existing staging area was in Wellington. Um, the other staging areas are Lake Street uh, Trailhead in Picton, uh, Highway 49 Trail Inn in Picton, Stanley Street Bloomfield, Station Road in Hillier, Salem Road, Ameliasburg, and the Botany Court in, in Ameliasburg. Those were all chosen by county staff. And the reason they were chosen, somebody asked me the other day why, is that they were basically public land that was on the trail. So that was kind of one of the choices, where do we have public land on the trail? Okay. Um, I thought I'd throw in a couple little pictures here for those. I don't know how many people have ever seen the uh, staging area in Wellington. Got people who haven't been there, but anyways, a couple little things. Uh, what's on the site there? There's a there's a, quite a lovely kiosk that was built, kind of an homage to the train station. Um, just show a couple pictures of it. Uh, a little bit of landscaping around it. There's a um, um, a bicycle repair stand that was donated to us. There's bike parking. There is a um, a portable toilet that is kind of hidden in the in, around a, a framing area, so it doesn't look like it's a permanent toilet. It's actually a portable toilet within that uh, in that. Uh, in that uh, framework. And also that's a better look at the kiosk. And within the kiosk we have things like interpretive signage of some of the donors from the royalty uh, from the, uh, the Rotary Club and also kind of a history of uh, kind of interpret interpretation of the area, a uh, history of, of, of some of the uh, uh, previous tenants on the, on the property and, uh, and a couple of other things. A quick update. Um, one of the reasons that we're here is that the terms of reference for the ad hoc committee really only allow us to make uh, to uh, develop a staging area parking in 2019. It was $7,000 per site, so that's the limit to what the ad hoc committee has as far as the as the the. the um, the staging areas are. But in the meantime, the, founding, the county foundation has brought a donor to us willing to fund and build out the following amenities for the Lake Street Trailhead. Um, basically the stylized parking uh, that I, uh, kiosk that I showed you a little bit about in Wellington, bicycle parking or repair station, we're talking some picnic tables, seasonal washroom, foliage and planters for beautification, and pathway and a layout design. The donation that we've been offered is $18,000 um, and in that process when we were looking at we also have a volunteer landscape architect student who's been working as a donation to the, to the process too on a design layout for the, sti for the site. This is, um, kind of, this is kind of an overview of the Lake Street Trailhead right now. And you can kind of see, if you can kind of look up there, there's a, a tree line to the side. I think most of you be familiar with that. Um, there is land onto the south side of the, of the, uh, the parking lot, but really inaccessible because it really becomes the front lawn of the, the neighbors next door. Kind of, there's not a lot we can do with it. Um, so that leaves, leaves the whole rest of the area, which traditionally has been um, I call it just a dusty parking lot, uh, and I think a lot of people would agree on that. So that was what, that's kind of the space we were working with. Um, this is kind of an overview, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is kind of an overview of, of what um, one of the designs were for the lot and what you've got is basically um, kind of roadway systems that are pathways, um, there's parking, there's a room for the kiosk, uh, potentially a portable washroom, some areas where things can be added into the future, um, uh, but really the amenities I kind of talked to before with a pretty, but I, I think a quite a nice uh, layout. I'll show you a couple of, uh, there's kind of a little bit overview picture of that um, to see it a little bit better. All the black areas are really walkways and driveways um, and, uh, and trailways, really access to pedestrians and cyclists and cars and to the trail. A um, couple little um, uh, 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 picnic tables there and some area. The idea on that was to keep it pretty low maintenance, there'd be no grass we're looking at. Uh, there is some grass on the tree line side, but that would probably be uh, wood chips and then gravel, much as what's on the trail, really is the, the trail base for that. Uh, 
part of a 3D model this came out of it. This kind of shows you a little bit of what it might look in the future. Uh, the trees are kind of oversized. We're going to be lucky if we can just get little planter ones. Uh, but that was just to give you an idea. And kind of an idea of what, what it might look like in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of an overview. So really, what is our ask to council? Um, what we're asking is that you allow the ad hoc committee to work with the county foundation and the donor to finalize a build design and the build of the Lake Street Trailhead site in 2019 with similar amenities and allocations of land as we see at the Wellington site. A main millennium trail, trailhead site that the county could be proud of. The donation we were looking for, the total amount of the budget would be the $7,000 that have already been allocated for, um, for doing parking and then $18,000 in, in the donation, the private donation. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. So making Prince Edward County a safer and healthier place to live, work and play. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Patrick. Are there any questions to clarify the deputation? Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a question. So you've got that um, uh, that picture up there of. Uh, so you you want to, what your vision is to use that whole parking area for for this uh, for this um, staging area, I guess. Is that? Yeah. Well, ba basically using the land layout, what is in Wellington, which is about 25% parking, and then the rest is is grass areas, picnic table, um, kiosk, and some and some and some um, beautification that was done in Wellington. But use the whole the whole area, yes, because it has been designated as that whole area has been designated as the stage staging area for the Millennium Trail. Okay. The only problem I see is because there's a lot of that gets used for a lot of parking, overflow parking from the liquor store, from the uh, convenience store there. So I, I'm just a little worried about parking in general in that area. So I'm just not sure using the whole thing for this is the right way to go. <clears throat> Councillor McNaughton. It's practically my neighbor, and I'm I feel comfortable with it. I I go by it every day, um, and I ride the trail every day, so maybe I'm a bit biased. <laughs> but um, as as a neighbor of this, I would love to see this, and I'm not concerned about the parking because usually when I'm there, I do see the parking lot. It does on at very very high traffic uh, times of the year, uh, it gets used. Otherwise, it tends to be relatively empty right now. It's just got construction vehicles and gravel in it, but so I I love this, and. Good luck to you. Yeah, I'll make a point. This is not a final design. It's basically an interim design that we would like to, just to give you an idea what it might look like. Right. Any other? Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, thank you, Bear, for your, your uh, presentation. And I appreciated having a chance to talk to you earlier in the week for about an hour. And you answered a lot of my questions there. But for my colleagues that weren't in the room, uh, one of the questions uh, or comments that I made to you then had to do with uh, maintenance of this site if, if and when it's developed. And of course, the, it was described as a uh, seasonal bathroom and you addressed that. It's a porta potty hidden in a shed that looks a lot like an old fashioned outhouse, just for clarity. <laughs> if you go to the Wellington site, you'll see what they want to replicate there. Um, so I guess my question is, can you elaborate a little bit more? about the potential uh, uh, maintenance costs. Yeah, when we, uh, when we talked to staff um, earlier on in the, in the committee, clearly that's one of the big issues. It means one of the issues with the trail is long-term maintenance on it. And one of the things down there it is, you know, it's dusty for a reason. There's just no water there, right? And so the, the, the idea of putting down grass, there is grass on the, on the other side of the tree line, but putting grass down in there, which is first of all, would be too expensive. And second of all, it would, it would have to be maintained. So the idea was to use the gravel pathways with the same gravel we're using on the trail, uh, and then use the other thing Probably probably wood chips, but something that is a low uh, a low maintenance uh, uh, product to be used at, and so that wouldn't be wouldn't be onerous for for county staff to uh, to maintain that. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Forrester, Mr. Chair, 
Thanks, Patrick. Uh, I love the idea of a st uh, staging area. I guess my one concern and only concern would be maximizing the amount of parking that we would have in that area. As, as we all know, we don't have enough of it in the county. And I'm looking here, and I know it's concept drawing, but there's only six parking spots. Uh, and it looks like single cars in there. Uh, I guess combination talking to you and, and maybe to Robert, would staff be looking at this to see how we could maximize the amount of parking that we have in there for trailers? Because it does get used in the wintertime also as a staging area for snowmobiles and I think ATVs that come in there pulling trailers. So six spots can get filled up very quickly and you need room to turn around. Yeah. Yeah, is that a, was that a question to me? Well, I have it could a be if you yeah, could answer, answer that. that. If not, it should be a question to the deputy. Yeah. yeah, so uh, the answer we have to that is that we, we talked to a lot of staff. Actually, we talked to um, uh, the, the, the snowmobile representative on the committee and asked about um, ATVs and about whether we needed to be able to handle a, a car with a trailer. And what came down to is that probably not. And the reason is that most ATVs are owned by the people that live in the county, so they don't trailer it anywhere. And the other one that we found that was kind of interesting was that um, um, uh, the county is not an AT de destination because the trail is too short. That came up in sort of ad hoc kind of things. And I know all the questions <laughs> that we get um, through the, for the Prec Trail Committee on, on, for ATVs and parking, it's only around Caring Place because people want to park there and then ride the trail from one end to the other. So I don't think that's a really an issue. I think what happens when you put, when you put a, a trailer on the end of it, you end up just eating up so much space for what is may or may not be um, uh, a need. And as far as, as parking on there goes, we wanted to use the guideline that, that we use in Wellington because there's really no fundamental overviewing document for the staging areas that says it has to be 30 cars per square inch or something like that. So we kind of, uh, uh, Wellington's always been a guideline. So we used about a 25%, and if you take a look at the amount of part of the, that, well, that would be trail and access and things like that, clearly there's room to put a couple more parking spaces in. I think when you start pushing that out, you get beyond, you know, you're back to being a parking lot. But, uh, but, uh, but I don't think that's an issue with, uh, with trailers. We also, as part of the trail, uh, when it was redone, we took a, 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 there's a, there's a spur that goes up to um, Upper Lake Street. And we felt that Upper Lake Street area was, certainly has enough room up there to park a couple, a couple cars with the trailer on it if necessary. Uh, and that was why that spur was done, was to sort of give an option on that. Councillor so, McMahon. Okay, sorry, I'd just like a follow up on that. And now I'd possibly like to direct it to Commissioner McCauley. Well, we do that, Jamie, when we get to debating the motion. Okay, this was yeah, a simple question. Okay. Questions to staff. At that time. We'll keep our questions to the deputy right now. Councillor McMahon. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Forrester touched on what I was at, initially asking you about. But additionally, uh, is this paid parking or? Is it paid parking? Yeah. Uh, we hadn't thought of that. That's not part of our mandate. Um, uh, we, we have a mandate to provide parking, not paid parking. Whatever council in this, in the, in, 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 uh, decides that how that gets, is that a way to fund it? I, I have no real problem with that. Um, it could be revenue stream that could be done for that. but. But, I mean, our worry is that it just becomes a parking lot for the LCBO and a parking lot for the, 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 the worm place across the street and the tickets and all that, and, and that it just it doesn't, there's no room for the people that want to actually use it. That was one of our concerns. That's why, as you can probably see in the, in the design, the new entrance to that lot, which is under new, with, with, with the work plans going on on Lake Street, has pushed the entrance right to the, further, the southern part of that to kind of keep it as just, and you, you know how parking lots work. If, if you've got to walk 20 feet, uh, you're going to make a decision on that uh, to get to the LCBO and things like that. So I, I, I think that we, we wanted to have it far enough south that it wasn't an overflow parking lot and also provide enough parking that would be, uh, that would be critical to uh, the people that are users. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Ferguson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Pat, and uh, thank you for all the work you've been doing on the uh, on the trail. It really is quite remarkable. I've got a, a couple of things um, th about the trailer parking um, this time of year. Um, that that parking lot is used by people hauling all kinds of different um, types of trailers and sundry things behind their car as they go into the LCBO. Um, so I'm wondering about the design considerations as, as laid out here and how that 
how th that layout would accommodate those those vehicles and any visit down there right now you can see the problems that that it was actually never face. designed to accommodate the vehicles for the LCBO parking or the agrarian market. It was designed to accommodate parking for the trail. Yeah, it I, is a staging area, yeah. and that was and so part of that was to understand is that how do you how do you limit to that? Do you just make it a big open parking lot and you have no control over it? So the idea of that was to have um, some infrastructure. To be, the, the, the reason that the, ben, the benefactor came with this sort of said, they didn't want to see the dirty parking lot anymore. They wanted to have a beautification of that area of the, of the, of the county. Mm -hmm. And it's, since it's the main trailhead, you know, which is, this is like where people are going to enter onto that from Picton, it would be nice to have something beyond than what is just a parking lot. Yeah, no, I, I but I understand that. I just that, want Steve. to make sure we have to consider public safety here and where those vehicles would go otherwise. Um, the other question I have is the donation amount of $18,000. Is that contingent on this design or a variation thereof? Yes. It is. What, yeah. what, what are the specifics of that donation, if you don't mind my asking? Um, the specifics are is that it's a beautification process, product, uh, process and that the, the parking gets limited as part of that donation. Okay. Um, all right. Because there's no guidelines for how many parking spaces that should go in a staging area, so you're kind of making it up as we go along here, unfortunately. So we use we use uh, Wellington as a guideline, and get, well, like, Wellington provides about 25 to 30 percent of the area is for parking. So that's what we kind of use for that as a guideline for this. There's room to add more, but I uh, significantly I don't know. Okay. It's all negotiations, right? Just when you got one, a donor. One. Uh, there, so I assume there's conversation with staff about the various options to make this work? Well, the idea of what we're asking for is to be able to take it back and make a decision on it as a committee and working with staff to come up with a final plan. And, and part of that is going to there's going to be donated time in that because the kiosk is probably going to be about $10,000. About five of that is going to be the materials and then we'll be looking at donated time to actually build it. So it's 25 grand doesn't take you far in a parking lot. That, it might get you 50 feet of highway, but that's about luck, or maybe 10, 20, I don't know. But anyways. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Councilor Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you've had some experience in Wellington, and you have a porta potty in Wellington. So is that currently, what do you get, like a weekly, bi-weekly pump out? I'm just wondering about the traffic and the what you anticipate your maintenance schedule, what you would require. Well, first of all, we don't, we're not involved in the maintenance scheduling. And, and second of all, we haven't done any porta potty studies in the county. Um, uh, also not part of our mandate for the, uh, for the ad hoc committee. I'm being facetious, but no, I'm just, just, that, not, that has not been studied. Okay. If it gets down to the question of the staging areas and what has been committed to them, there's really been just space. You know, and I think what's going to happen is that every one of those spaces, as we get to them, this one kind of moves things ahead. We, what we were planning was next year was basically going out and raising money to finish off the staging areas because there was no budget for it this year. This money came ahead. So what we're just saying, asking to do is this, for this particular site, because we have a benefactor, can we make a decision on this? This does not necessarily affect every, this, every one of the staging areas on the road, and I think they have to be taken individually. Okay, sorry, maybe just... Is there a porta potty in, in the Wellington? Yes, there is. Yeah. Okay, so it's being maintained by the county. I I am not an expert on no. porta potties. So no, I, I just wondered. Probably staff. Okay, so you don't. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. I'll ask the question later. I just wondered who was who was maintaining. Yeah, it, it's part of the. Yeah, I guess part of the maintenance. Yeah. Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I like the design myself. Um, I know parking is an issue. Living close to the Millennium Trail where I am, it doesn't matter if you provide parking or not, they're going to pull over along the side of the road and park anyways. So I do like this idea to make, make it beautiful for the people who are using the trail. So you have my support on this one. Thanks. Thank you. Any other? Councillor Roberts. You've already spoke, haven't you, Phil? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to add to the choir, I think it's a great presentation. I think it's a great project. Um, I'd be uh, very, uh, I'd be much more comfortable doing one thing well with this with this initiative, uh, as as you've uh, brought it forward with the don donor, rather than trying to jam a couple of other 
solutions to unrelated problems into it and not doing any of those things well. So it looks like you've got a great um, uh, approach here, and I look forward to what you and staff come up with. Congratulations. It's good. Thank you. Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, I, Mr. Chair. I thought I'd wait till everybody else had a chance. I just, uh, through you to the deputant, uh, earlier in your presentation, yeah. Jamie's microphone. Uh, earlier in your presentation, there, there's a page, uh, page four, outlining the seven staging areas across the county. And, and you and I just discussed it briefly at, at your, uh, your office. Uh, first of all, I, I'm going to say I really like the idea. I think it's important that we actually get one of these staging areas up and running. The one in Wellington is wonderful. We need one to uh, add a head, but and I'm not going to call it the foot, but we need another head in Ameliasburg. Uh, and I know we discussed that. Any thoughts? Do you have any thoughts uh, on what your next project would be and where you would get the money for it? Well, I mean, all along, all along it's been, you know, once we've got the trail done, you know, and it's not done yet, we have to get through this year and we got to get the wetlands done and things like that. Then the next step would be sitting down and working with the communities and raising money for the individual ones. Um, the interesting thing, if you, I, I don't have a map of all of them, but every one is a different shape and size. You know, you'd be lucky on some of them if you had 25% air to get two car parking in it. So, and, you know, and I think that's a decision as we find, you know, we've had a bit of feedback from the, uh, from the state staging areas from where they might be. Um, and I, clearly what seems to be is that if you're going to do one, you really need to have public input, local public input. So you make sure you carry, cover all the issues in that. And I think part of the public input gives us an opportunity to get to find a design that people like and maybe get them to help fund it. Uh, and that's going to be kind of, kind of town by town or village by village or hamlet by hamlet, as it says on the, uh, on the, uh, the Millennium Trail uh, thing. So. Um, does that kind of answer your question, or I, did I ramble on a bit? No, no, you answered my question there. If I could just one quick follow-up, uh, and, and it pertains to st having an additional one, and I'm going to I'm going to use Ameliasburg or even Hillier because there are three at the West End, identif potentially identified. Uh, I suppose you would like to get a, a, a donor to assist with that because you we, mentioned fundraising before. Yeah, we have. We, you know, we've been. I mean, I live in Bloomfield, and we've been talking to Baba and some of them, you know, and they're kind of interested. They, they, as with anything, they like to sort of see. Not everybody wanders out to Wellington, and Wellington was kind of done independently, you know. Um, so they want to sort of see. Well, yeah, what's it going to look like? So I think it, you're right that it becomes a, you know, kind of a model that we can kind of uh, use to move forward with. Do variations on, but in the end of it, you kind of you can't just shoehorn everything into a small piece of land if the land isn't there to do it. Yeah. But in public input is clearly because it's any parking is an issue with a lot of the public. It doesn't matter where it is, you know. Uh, and in my view, it, it, it's important that we continue to develop this Millennium Trail. It's been it was established in 1998. You know, it's been a long time getting to this point, and, and I'm, I frankly, am glad to see that we have one of the trailheads, regardless of where it is. It's not a east-west issue. It's the fact that you got a donor, which is great, and they'd like to see this one done. I hope a donor from the west end of the county steps up and and says, "Yes, I'd like to beautify that end," and then we can have that that continuation, that wonderful link of east to west in our community. So, anyways, that's just my statement as well as some questions. Thanks, Bear. Any other committee? I have a question, Patrick. Yeah. And I think I uh, proposed it to you before. I'm not sure why you wouldn't air use the area south of that tree line for those picnic tables that you have on the other side when it's grass and it's owned by the municipality. Unfortunately, there's a tree line, which means you to make it as part, the of the, as part of the trail, you'd have to take some of the trees down. Because it's sort of like, here's your park, and, then, and to go if you want to use picnic tables, go on the other side. And it virtually is almost an extension of the lawn of the neighbor. So, and also well, getting neighbors, access to it. Neighbors are maintaining it. It's municipal yeah. land. Yeah. And you could cut a hole through the Manitoba maples without taking the whole tree line. I just think my opinion yeah. is we should maximize the land that we own. And so I, that's that I, was my I'm question. I'm open to more picnic tables. Yeah. Uh, you know, but okay. uh, the issue is that there's no access to it. It would have to be from within the within the well, boundaries within of the of the uh, of, of the staging area. Yeah. 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 Okay. Having said that, can I have a motion to 
receive the deputation. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Is there any debate? I just have one. Yes. Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for uh, the Commissioner, I was just wondering as we move ahead on this that we really look at our parking and I just want to make sure because every year we discuss parking, we spent over 700000 down on King Street there that we don't lose any more because this is a bottleneck. It always has been. And if we give up 10, 15 parking spots, because I just look at the initial design here, that there would be a little driveway coming out. Would there be parking on the road? Because if they can't park there, where do they park? We just turned down an application the other night across from Home Hardware because of safety concerns. And here we have a very busy intersection where a lot of cars pull in and, and just pull off the side of the road. So I just want to make sure. I'm all for trail entrances. I think we need one everywhere. There's, there's big advantages of this, but we have to utilize our parking spots because I'm sure we're going to be looking for more in the near future. And going down to six, which could be 20, concerns me greatly. So I just want to make sure as we move forward that staff investigates this property to make sure we utilize the space that we have there while still putting in a park at and everything else, because I think it could be done in combination. Thank you, Councillor Forrester. I, I'm going to clarify what I feel I heard you said, Jamie, is that staff will be reviewing this and approving it. Is that, and with the, with the total suite of requirements that Council feels is necessary for this site. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I would not jump to that conclusion myself. Um, I'm looking at page 13 of the presentation or, or page 18 of your agenda, and I think the intent, as I heard it, was that the committee would take this draft, uh, go back to the donor, and have a conversation about finalizing the design. Uh, there are staff members that sit on that committee, but I would not necessarily say that they're in the end going to report back or bring back if there are issues arise or, or concerns raised, uh, is the councillor suggesting then that the draft is the draft and the, and the direction be what uh, the deputant wants, which is go back and fin finalize it, but is the councillor thinking to have it come back to council and you get to see the final design before it's constructed? Because there's no mechanism currently for this committee to be vetted by staff other than the members we sit on it, the, the two members that sit on it. I'm asking if I'm and I'm asking if our technical staff can review the aspects of the site plan because we have the expertise in our staff that review site plans, like the configuration and number of parking spaces. I, I just thought that it might be an opportunity for the municipality to contribute to the successful design of this staging area. The, the two staff that sit on that committee, one of them is our technical staff, so I would expect that be implicit in what he's doing. but. Uh, I just, as the councillor was discussing it, um, after this point, council would not know what is built until it has been built. Councillor Maynard. Thank you. Well, generally when we have a deputation like this, we would receive it, and if we were looking for more information, and that's so I would say that we receive it, and that we uh, direct it back to staff for a report. Uh, you've mentioned, there's been a, a few things mentioned on, on the design, and I think also we need to know the, uh, the budgetary implications, because there's gonna, obviously there will be uh, ongoing maintenance in this, uh, so, you know, parking constraints, uh, layout, budgetary implications. Clearly, we don't have any budget this year to do any maintenance on it, and I, I don't know what the, the time frame is, but uh, I would, if I'd get a seconder, we'll, we'll receive it and then send it back to staff for a, uh, for a report. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd second that motion, and I'd, I'd want it in, in that uh, report uh, to cover the parking that's already there. As Councillor Forrester said, where are we putting all these extra cars that's coming in if we're taking all that parking away? So the report's got to be very specific about all the, the parking that we're going to lose. 
So if I may, then I, get, I think that's a, a report and to include um, parking considerations, a maintenance plan and uh, budgetary uh, impact. And that's seconded by Councillor Nyman. Any other debate on the amended motion? Okay, then we'll call a vote on the amended motion. Could I have that read, please? That the Millennium Trail Upgrade Project be referred to staff for a report to include parking, ma a maintenance plan, and budgetary impact. All those in for clarification, uh, Mr. Chair, at what point would this report be due back here? Because, and I'll clarify my reason for asking that question, is during my conversation with Mr. Maloney, their intent is to start working on this this fall, if I'm not mistaken. I, and I know I can't ask him a question now, but I'd just like clarification you, on Councilor timelines for return. Saint Jean, I think that's important. We don't want to lose the the donation that's been offered. It, it, I don't know the status of that, but I'm hoping this can happen in a timely manner and maybe we can put it, ask our acting CAO to help us with the scheduling of such a report. Uh, well, through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd suggest the first thing is finalize the design as proposed and then vet that through the report. So uh, I think it's safe to leave it with the committee that they know there's an urgency and if council is wanting to see the final design and have some input uh, around it, that can be done fairly quickly. Uh, at this point, I, I don't know if it would be the first committee of the whole in August if they would be ready, but I would suspect by the last committee of the whole in August that they would have been through the design, finalize the design, and staff can then vet and prepare the report. That, that sounds acceptable. Is that acceptable to you, Councillor St. Jean? Yes, uh, that, uh, that's a timeline. That's what I want to hear. Thank you. It's not embedded in the motion, but... If, if I may, we can. I just, uh, with the budget, with the, with the budgetary impacts, we just want to make sure that we're not getting ahead of ourselves on next year's, on next year's budget. So we'll be looking at, I would be expecting a kind of a, you know, an ongoing global budget and how we are going to, uh, to maintain any more park space. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a small question <clears throat> because it was mentioned three or four times you have to have public input. So, and that was by Mr. Mahoney there. So I'm just wondering if it's coming back that quick, where's the public input coming from? Because I think you're going to have a lot of people want to say, have a say about that parking or lack of that's going to come up. So I just want to know where that public input's coming from. Well, that question's directed to staff. Well, Mr. Chairman, I can assist, but I'd suggest that the committee is the one that's the proponent. So, so, uh, so Mr. Maloney can take that direction back that he somehow has to engage the public on yes. whatever the design is he's finalizing. Yes, I think leaving it with the committee and they've proposed it. So that's important. That'll come back in due time with our report that that's been undertaken. Just, just if I may, for clarification. So the, the report will be coming from our staff, right? They're just going to the take the work. The report's from our staff, but the committee will be facilitating the finalization of the design right. and the public <clears throat> consultation. That's what I understand is the committee's. Okay. As, yeah. as long as the staff is going to comment on each of those yeah. items. And as Mr. McCauley said, there's technical staff on that committee who will assist. Thank you. Okay, we have the amendment on the floor. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion's passed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 4.2. A deputation by Barry Davidson to address committee regarding the Millennium Trail Terms of Reference expansion. Barry. My name is Barry Davidson. I am from Wellington. Oh. No, it's, it's only verbal. <laughs> Uh, 
My name is Barry Davidson. I'm from Wellington, and I'm 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 here with a uh, follow-on presentation to uh, Patrick's uh, presentation. Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, councillors, and members of the public. Um, I'm, I'm making a request to ex expand the t t terms of reference of the ad hoc uh, committee to upgrade the Millennium Trail. And the request is to ex expand the f f facilities at all of the launch points, uh, similar to the proposal for Lake Street that you j just heard. but. Uh, uh, probably because the land available at the other launch points is not as large, it would be a m more modest uh, Im improvements. <coughs> these these uh, Im improvements would only be considered after we have f finished all of the items that are in the, uh, the current uh, plan to uh, upgrade the Millennium Trail and Using only the the budget that is uh, in in the in the uh, 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 project. So, so in, in addition to the parking lots that are authorized in the current budget. Uh, we could add information kiosks and picnic tables, uh, bike repair stations, and uh, uh, if if there was budget, uh, a, t a tree to uh, uh, have the p p picnic table in the shade. So to reiterate, I'm not asking for any additional funding but uh, simply to expand the terms of reference so that uh, unification of the, the other launch points c could be carried out uh, under the existing budget. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Any questions? Are there any questions from committee members? Seeing none, could I have a motion Put on the floor, please. Moved by Councillor Nyman. Seconded by Councillor Prinzen. Councillor Nyman, if you could read that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let the deputation by Barry Davidson regarding the Millennium Trail terms of reference expansion be received. Any debate? Councillor St. Jean. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. So with regards to just simply receiving this, we're not actually taking any action uh, based on the request. At I mean. this point, that motion is to receive only. At what point should I make a motion to, or should, can I offer an amendment to this? Have at it. I would offer the amendment that if I could get a seconder, that uh, the request be uh, <coughs> granted. As, and if I could further explain why I want to do that. <clears throat> Do I have a seconder? Yes, thank you. Councillor Roberts has second that motion. So I can speak oh. to the amendment? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, your options are to refer it to staff for report or receive it and uh, approve it is not an option at a deputation. It's not on the agenda. And I would also further say that the terms of reference for the committee, as Mr. Davidson has alluded to, is already slated to come forward in your August docket for consideration of the proposed amendments. So the matter is already coming before Council and I would uh, caution against approving expanded terms of reference of a committee off the floor. So this deputation provides information that something for something already slated to come forward in August. That's correct and, and actually they, they were advised that we were bringing the report forward in August but chose to speak uh, today anyway so we would simply feed this into the report that's coming forward. Thank you for that clarification. That's very helpful. And thank you for that clarification. Uh, uh, I just my, my, my reason for the amendment was just simply so this didn't languish and disappear. I'm happy to hear that there will be a report coming forward in the future, so I will withdraw that amendment. That's acknowledged. Thank you. 
Okay, anybody else have anything to add to this de motion debate? Seeing none, I'll call a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to item 4.3, a deputation by Helene Richet on behalf of Friends of Salmon Point to address committee regarding Salmon Point. Helene. There we go, is that better? Uh, the presentation outline, I will describe who this group is because I'm not it, I'm just a member. Uh, the I'll present the existing land use, uh, the permitted land use, the actual proposed. I'll discuss the Salmon Point geometry, the traffic, existing and future potentially. Uh, our main point is road safety and we have some recommendations for council. So we're a group called Friends of the Salmon Point. We're, we're a, a group of people who live on Salmon Point. We've gotten together several times. Uh, we've discussed issues that concern us all and this presentation is um, the concern that we all share. So we, uh, we developed goals for, <laughs> for the Friends of Salmon Point. Uh, the first one is keeping our roads safe, uh, protecting our aquifer, uh, which we actually got something from the Minister of the Environment on. Uh, we think that growth should be carefully planned. Uh, we'd like to keep the area's unique feel. Uh, we want to respect the environment and we wanted to get to know and become friends with our neighbours. So on to land use. Uh, Salmon Point Road, for those who haven't been there, um, I'll speak excluding uh, Quinty's Isle Camp Park for now, is a rural area of approximately 50 homes with only a handful of year-round residents. It is a dead end road. Local population is dwarfed in the summer season by an influx of people using 225 serviced camping sites and 460 permanent service sites with pre fab modular homes. So if you have three people per site, which is pretty conservative, you get more than 2,000 additional people in the summer on Salmon Point Road. So I uh, actually read the official plan, the county plan, and I spent some hours on it. So the plan actually covers special tourist areas. It covers Sandbanks uh, Provincial Park. It also uh, covers in uh, certain articles uh, Sandbanks Village. But it hasn't seemed to have kept up to pace with Quinty's Isle because in the existing plan in section 4.5.4, it refers to Quinty's Isle as permitted use shall be limited to a maximum of 175 transient unservice camping sites. We're very far from what's now in the plan. As stated previously, there are now 685 sites and they're all serviced. So here's a map. I'm, I'm assuming you all pretty well know this, but this is County Road 18, if you watch my mouse. And this is Salmon Point Road. Whoa, sorry. And this is Salmon Point Road. This is Quinty's Isle here. This map comes from the official plan. Uh, and people come out of Quinty's Isle and out they go on to 18. They can take a little jog on Cowan if they're going that way. This is Sandbanks uh, Outlet Beach, right here. So it's very close. Uh, there is a new development that is being planned. In fact, I believe it's being built, but uh, Quinty's Isle has requested a zoning, a rezoning of land to allow construction of 337 sites with modular homes. The address of this uh, project and company, because it is a separate company, is 558 Wellbanks Road. Uh, they have included in their plan an emergency entrance on Wellbanks, but it's only an emergency entrance, not an entrance, an alternate entrance. It's a different corporate entity, as I said before, than Quinty's Isle Camp Park. In fact, they've included an easement so that the other company can go into the existing Quinty's Isle and use the entrance on Salmon Point Road. 
So in the uh, official plan, section 4.0, there's an article 4.3.6, adequate and safe access to a maintained public road shall be provided. Traffic associated with commercial use shall not pose a safety hazard. Um, Quinty's Isle is a commercial use. In our opinion, Salmon Point Road is already very dangerous. 4.4.3, commercial development. Uh, following criteria should be reviewed in considering a new or expanded resort. You have to view the adequacy of public road access to the site and the impact of traffic on surrounding land uses and on safety of pedestrians. And I would say cyclists as well, and I'll just demonstrate that later. For that reason, we really feel a second access is necessary. So the road geometry. At around Nelson's Lane, which is the first kilometer of the road, uh, it's 21 feet wide on average, but it pinches to only 19 feet in that curve right before Nelson's Lane. There's no appreciable shoulders, especially in the sharp horizontal and vertical curve, which means it turns and rises. There's no line down the center of the road on Salmon Point Road. The line of sight is extraordinarily restricted in certain spots and the speed limit is a full 70 kilometers an hour. There are signs in orange, which are suggested signs for 40 kilometers an hour, but the actual speed limit is 70. A few pictures. Oops, they say a thousand words. So this picture is heading west from Salmon Point. As you can see, you don't see much. And this is uh, in the spring before uh, vegetation. And then this is just a normal size camper. It's not a very big one. Notice there's not much room on either side. <laughs> And this was a picture in the spring as well. So this ditch, so the road, no shoulder, big ditch. The ditch is uh, draining all of the lands of Rankin's farms, all of that up gradient land all comes down there and this ditch runs uh, quite heavily in the spring. And in the summer it's hidden and people wouldn't know they'd fall in a hole. Um, traffic, so again, during the summer season, we get a hell of a lot more traffic. And it consists frequently of large trucks pulling one or two trailers, boats, big trailer things, and they must share the road with pedestrians and lots of cyclists. At the Athol public meeting last year, the ward's consultants quoted an increase of 70% more traffic on this narrow dead end rural road should the expansion go forward. And there's only one way in, for 2,000 people now and 3,000 people or more with the expansion. So again, a few more pictures. In the first picture, you see a car, a small trailer. I don't know where a cyclist would fit. This big monster pretty well takes up the whole road. There's no room for anything else. It's only 19 feet wide there, remember. Uh, I took this picture last week. There was some cyclists, a family of cyclists coming up the hill. Um, I'd forgotten about this, but as you're climbing a hill on a bicycle and you're having trouble, you start going ziggy-zaggy back and forth. So this little boy, I didn't click fast enough, but he was actually almost totally on the other side. By the so he veers into the road, but he's not alone. A lot of people will do that climbing a road. So here, the same family was off to the side. The parents told the little boy to move over, and here's the car, and I don't know where a trailer would fit there. Here's another picture, take it a few minutes later. So there's a car, there's a small trailer. Where a cyclist would fit is beyond me. Back to access points. So Cherry Valley, um, there's no census data, but I'm assuming there's two, 300 people in Cherry Valley. There's, they can come in from 10, from 18, they can go around a little bit. Bloomfield, well, there's thousands of ways in and out of Bloomfield, even though there's not very many people. Uh, Wellington, it's mostly 33, but as you can see, there's several roads heading north and they all do connect. So there's ways around in Wellington. Back to Quinty's Isle with 2,000 people now and maybe 3,000, including us, the 50 or so. Um, only one way in or out. So our requests are simple. Uh, we asked council if they would upgrade Salmon Point Road, specifically the dangerous first kilometer, uh, regardless of the proposed development. 
Uh, we feel the council should demonstrate that it has taken all the precautions reasonable under the circumstances to protect health and safety of its users. users. Thing, the two first bullets are pretty quick. Paint a white line down the center of the road with a double white line in the dangerous curve so that no one sort of inches over to the other side or takes over the whole road, as well as adding signage indicating pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, reduce the speed limit to 50 kilometers an hour on Salmon Point Road. Increase the width of Salmon Point Road and its shoulder, but specifically in that dangerous curve in the first kilometer, we don't want a highway on Salmon Point Road. Um, there's a few things on the official plan and widths, but we don't want 26.2 meters on the whole of Salmon Point Road, but that's what is in the plan. Uh, and we really feel you should add a pedestrian path and a bike path. And the main reason for that is remember those 2,000 people in Salmon, in, in Quinty's Isle, uh, families take off for the day with all of them on bicycles, down there, hang a left on 18, and about two, 300 meters later, hang a left into the outlet beach because there's an entrance there for bicyclists and pedestrians. Our second request, make the full-time second entrance on Wellbanks Road a mandatory that it be a full-time entrance if you are to accept Quinty's Isle proposed development to be approved. And that's all I have. Thank you, Helene. Any questions? Any questions from the committee to the deputy? Seeing none. Oh, Councillor Forrester. Thank you. Hi, Helene. I, I just looking back there when we were talking about, uh, sorry, the number of uh, sites where you mentioned here there was 460 permanent sites. And I guess just for the record, well, what's your... What do you mean by six, 460 permanent service sites? Those are the um, modular home trailers that are sitting with a balcony yeah. and so on. But when you say uh, permanent, uh, you, uh, you understand they're seasonal, right? <laughs> I don't want to get into this discussion here, Jamie. Okay. Really no, no, I, well, I just like because if there's they're information. Not. If People live there full time. They're selling them in Belleville. If you want to go to the open house, they'll tell you they're selling them as full time homes. But okay. this is not the object of our discussion so here today. This is uh, I just have clarification topic. because this is a documentation. So all I'm asking here is you're doing a deputation to council. And when I look at, and I, I agree with most stuff in here, but there are not 460 permanent, they are seasonal sites. And council just needs to know that. Could, I, some, could I then get an official answer to all the questions I sent to Mr. Walsh and to council on that? Because I have not. And it's not in the plan, yeah. in the official plan. No. So, but as I said, this is not the point of our conversation today. No, I, I'm just making sure that as, because you're presenting information to, and I think this will be coming back maybe this year. I, I don't know for sure, but most of it will be clarified. But I'm just reading some of the stuff here. So there's information that I do know that I know there is not 460 permanent sites. They are seasonal sites only. So I know that for a fact. Thank you. That's good. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Councillor Forrester. Anyone else want to make that? Councillor Maynard. Just briefly, because uh, we would, uh, this is, this is a, uh, receive, a uh, receive motion, and I guess I'm, I'm just going to ask staff if there's any, uh, any validity in asking for, because I can't ask for staff comments here, so they would have to come back to report on any of the on the road uh, on the road safety this is requests. Questions to the deputy, or well, what I'm doing is before I take on their uh, request for a staff report, to asking staff if there's well, any validity in that. Right now, we're asking questions of the deputy. Okay. Do you have a question, Councilor Mayor? No. Okay. Seeing none. We'll move on to the motion, the recommended motion. If I could have a mover. Councillor Forrester, seconder. Councillor Nyman. Thank you. This is a Forrester Nyman motion, a deputation by Helene Riche of, on behalf of Friends of Salmon Point regarding Salmon Point be received. Thank you, so, Councillor Forrester. Now, Councillor Maynard. I'll, I will ask staff if um, if 
this stuff is our do we need to is there any um, reason for us to have a staff report on this or is it already uh, being taken care of another another fashion uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, the, the matter, the development that is being spoken about is before the planning department and is not moved forward at this point. So I, I would intend to take this material and inject it into that process and the deputy can certainly make a filing in that regard directly. Uh, I don't see the need to consider anything that is on the screen at this time. Uh, most of it will arise as factoring in the approval or not approval of the additional development. Um, could I just add, for the benefit of the deputant, that it was notwithstanding the, the further development of the site, some of the issues that were brought forward. Councillor Bullock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think what we're looking at is two things. One is the current unsafe condition, and I'm just wondering if that would be something we should, should send down to the traffic committee because that's the kind of thing that they would normally deal with, speed limits and, and markings. Um, so perhaps that would be the proper venue. Thank you, sir. Anyone else want to speak to this? Councillor Harper. I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I had the same view. We have two issues. One is the development, the other is the road. And I was just going to ask the staff if, if any of the issues regarding the road, whether it's lines or fixing the roads, is currently um, on a... Uh, uh, on a roads plan or is that something that in fact needs to go to the traffic committee to get to uh, to get started uh, to you mr chairman the the matters of the width of the road and improvement of the road would not be within the purview of the traffic committee but certainly a speed reduction request would be and i don't think they have ever dealt with them but i would suggest that the pedestrian or bike lane might be within the purview of the traffic committee as well they might weigh in on that uh, the road is not slated for any widening or upgrade at this point. It's a forest road, so there'd be land acquisition, so that would be a prolonged process. Uh, but the traffic committee would not normally deal with the physical road itself, uh, simply the operational characteristics. So a bike lane and speed could be referred to the traffic committee, and uh, they can make the, the request directly if they wish. They can make the same presentation to the traffic committee. Thank you. Councillor McNaughton. So, thank you. So, um, could you could you comment then further on the road widening and adding that to, without the benefit of an asset management um, list for roads at this point in time? Is is that uh, is it an area of concern already for county staff? Uh, it is a road of concern and not necessarily just because of the development, but because it is narrow, it is a forced road. Uh, and one of the ra things that uh, were raised when the development was put forward uh, was the impacts on that road, because as you heard, it was intended to access through that primary road. So whether widening falls to the development as a trigger or whether widening falls to the municipality simply due to existing traffic, I think is very much in the air. I would suggest that we have the asset uh, understanding before we initiate it, whether that comes through the planning or whether that comes through us indirectly if the planning is not approved by council. Because the interplay is if the road widening is a direct result of the development, you have a different set of circumstances to consider than if it is no development and we're simply dealing with an existing road. But we're still dealing with an existing safety issue on that particular, in right. that particular spot, so. But, but if it's been amplified by the growth, then there is an ability to engage that development in those efforts. Good thing. And if there is no development, then it falls 100% to us to address. Thank you. Thank you. So is there anyone else that wants to speak? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? It's passed. Okay, 4.4 um, is canceled today, so we'll move on to item number five. Comments from the audience on items on the agenda. <laughs> 
Is there anyone present today that would like to make comments on any item on the agenda? Yes. If you could just turn on the microphone and state your name into the microphone. Okay, testing, one, two, three, no. Uh, John Reddick, I live on Salmon Point Road. Um, and with respect to the last issue, um, safety is a concern. Um, and I would invite anybody who doesn't think it is to stand on that corner for about 20 minutes this weekend and you'll come away with a different point of view. Um, literally, there's people that are almost hit there on a daily basis and it's just a matter of time. Uh, so I think from a safety point of view, regardless of the process, and absolutely irregardless of whether the proposed development goes ahead or not, there's an existing safety issue there. I don't know how the funding worked for the bike lanes that were done over by the sandbanks part of the park. You know, they, and for those of you who don't know, they recently widened the road going between West Lake towards the sandbank portion. Um, and that's the kind of thing I think a bare minimum we need. And as Alain mentioned before, the we don't want the road to get widened to the point that it becomes a raceway. If anything, we want um, whatever the traffic committee deems appropriate to slow people down there. And, you know, there's, there's a number of different ways, and you guys are the experts, so we would um, ask you to look at that. But, you know, I, I, it, it's in the presentation. It's completely regardless of the proposal. I think that this needs to be addressed now because there's somebody's going to get killed there, and, and it's just a matter of time as it stands now. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else? <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Bob Mason, I'm a <clears throat> resident on Limestone Ledges off Seven Point. Uh, John's just been talking like that. I was uh, almost hit. I'm a cyclist as well. I cycle every day. And going around that corner, that corner is one of the most dangerous places in the county, full stop. It really is. And People have no idea. People come in from Toronto and elsewhere with these big trailers. They get off the county road, they see the road, Salmon Point, and they head off. And it's not a 70 mile, it's not a 70 kilometer speed limit. It's a, it's a lot faster than that. They come at you on the corner, and the other day I was cycling down the hill, I came onto the corner, and this guy came herring up the road. I don't know how fast he was going. He was in the middle of the road, he cut the corner, and there was nobody else on the road, I was on the road. Somebody came from behind me and lo and behold, it was almost that picture that Elaine showed there. This big trailer, the guy swerved, and of course, he's not looking at me, he's trying to avoid hitting the, the thing coming up. The trailer just, just came across like that, brushed me, thank goodness. I stayed on the bike and he just headed off down the road. And Tim Ward, I've talked to Tim Ward about that, and Tim Ward, I mean, they put a stop sign on the thing. People don't appreciate this is the county. It is not Toronto. And they race around the road with these trailers on, and, well, as John said, somebody's going to get killed. This morning, I came into town. There were two families on bikes, three kids, two kids on the other family, mother and father on each end of the thing, coming down the hill, this trailer comes up the hill, nobody was coming down, thank goodness. I came behind, I slowed down. Somebody's going to get killed. So the traffic committee, please get some signs, dangerous curve. It's not a big deal, it's not an expensive deal. Widening the road is an expensive deal. We're not worried about that. The big thing is, people need to be alerted that this is a dangerous corner, you can't put your foot down, and <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Bob. And I'm hoping that our members on the traffic committee will note this. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the audience, please? I'm Elizabeth Robb, and I live on Robb Lane, uh, which runs off Salmon Point Road. Marilyn Meineker uh, wanted to uh, make a, a statement here, and she's unable to be here today, so I am quoting her. Um, I will relate a recent experience. I am an avid cyclist and ride frequently on county roads. Last week, I left my home and cycled east on Salmon Point Road. As I neared the worst blind corner, it, that's an S-curve, by the way. It's, it's not just a, a curve, but it's an S-curve, so that, that's why the visibility is so difficult. 
As, she, as, uh, as I neared the worst blind corner, a large RV towing a boat started passing me. When we approached the corner, a large flatbed truck rounded the corner, swerving into the middle of the road. I had nowhere to go. There is no shoulder there with a deep ditch. I scrambled off my bike as quickly as possible to allow these vehicles to pass each other and hoped for the best. When I rounded the corner, I discovered on the other side there was also a family on bicycles with young, very wobbly children coming home from the beach. That is probably why the flatbed had encroached into the center. I will tell you this is not an uncommon scenario on this road. Often in the summer months, there are RVs, pickup trucks, dump trucks, cement trucks, flatbed trucks, and cars navigating this road alongside pedestrians and cyclists making their way to the provincial park beach. And one of the things that curdles my blood is that bicycles have these little carriages behind them with babies in them who don't have the power to say, let me out of here, I'm, I'm in danger. Um, Campers and tourists will often turn down Salmon Point Road and drive right down the middle. They are expecting this dead-end road is a quiet little country road. What they don't know is that there are over 3,000 inhabitants on this road during the summer months, as well as construction vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rob. Are there any others who want to make comments? Thank you. My name is Elaine Maharg and I live at 84 Nelson's Lane. And my concern basically is, as you've heard, is the safety aspect as when I come out of Nelson's Lane to make a left hand turn or a right hand turn, it's uh, Nelson's Lane is right in, you can picture the S, right in the center curve of that S lane. My question to Council is, have you looked into the probability of serious accident occurring on this dangerous stretch of Salmon Point Road in the near future? Have you considered this aspect if you increase the traffic on Salmon Point Road? And that is my question to Council. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Elaine. Do you, do you have a question for her? Well, I would like to try to answer okay. that. Sure. Because she has asked the question. Yes, I'd like to point out that the traffic around that whole area there, and I think every councillor knows me for the last seven years, that I've brought up safety concerns around that whole corner there with the need for bike paths because I've heard everybody say it, and I realized it is an accident waiting to happen, it and is. we have to address it. It's trying to get it put in the budget. I know I'm out of, I'm not supposed to be saying this right now, but I'm answering your question. Council is aware of it, yes. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, oh, any other? thank you, Elaine. Are there any other comments from the audience? One last comment, am I allowed? Um, I'm not sure, no, I don't think so. Not once you've made a deputation. Seeing none, could I have a motion to receive the comments, please? Moved by Councillor Nyman, seconded by Councillor Roberts. All those in favour? Opposed. That motion's carried. Okay. We'll move on to number six, items for consideration. And as discussed in the amended uh, confirmation of the agenda, we were going to move item number 6.7 forward as Councillor Bolick has to leave. So, Councillor Bolick, could you put that motion on the floor please? Yes, thank you Mr. Chair and uh, I can advise Council that uh, Councillor Nyman will be seconding this. Uh, you would like me to read it? All right. Better read it. Yep. So this is a Bullock Nyman motion. Whereas property taxes are the primary source of funding for Prince Edward County's operating budget to support the delivery of municipal services, and whereas the operating budget provides the necessary resources to deliver programs, services to meet the needs of the County of Prince Edward and accommodates for inflationary pressures, and whereas Council recognizes the staff requires sufficient time to consider and explore potential efficiencies in the budget, including alternative delivery models, if they result in ongoing savings prior to preparing the 2020 budget. 
and <clears throat> although there's looks uh, there's a typo in there it should say operating budget sorry and whereas council's intent is to reinvest any savings from operational budgets or that should say savings operational savings in strategic priorities now therefore be it resolved that the corporation of the county of prince edward Council requests that staff be directed to review 2019 departmental budgets with the aim of reducing operational expenditures for 2020 by 10 percent and that departments shall examine and list their operations into three levels one mandated by statute two mandated mandated by policy and three other and that council in recognizing the magnitude and impact of this complex task the focus shall be on structural and operational efficiencies rather than on deferred expenditures, with reductions not impacting service levels within a department. However, if the full 10% reduction is not possible without impacting service levels within a department, the reasons and their impact shall be detailed in the report. And that such efficiencies should be reported back to Council with a detailed report and simplified draft budget at the second committee of the whole meeting in October. Thank you, Councillor Bullock. Does anyone from the committee want to make a comment on the motion? Or speak to it? Councillor Roberts. Uh, <clears throat> just to speak in support of, of the motion, I think that it's prudent um, for us to uh, proceed to this undertaking. Um, I'd be happier if it was linked to strategic direction outcomes, um, and maybe that's possible in, 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 um, uh, through staff. Um, and I also think that um, uh, um, we are going to get hit by the provincial government with regard to municipal cuts, and I think it will go further. It's my personal opinion. It will go to the st structure of municipalities. So. Um, this is a prudent undertaking, and I support it. Thank you. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm in support of this. I think based on the public's reaction to our 2019 budget, um, I'm sure that they would welcome uh, a look at uh, this very thing. I think it will, to Councillor Roberts' point, I think it will trigger discussions around service levels and asset management, uh, um, so I think that will accelerate those discussions. So I, I think it's got a lot of uh, positives um, and will help us in the long run. Thank you. Councillor McNaughton. I think it's interesting that we've got this in item 6.5 on the same agenda regarding um, regarding the uh, money that's been uh, transferred to us as, a, as part of a that we're creating a reserve for modernization for right now. And I'm just, I think I have a question for Mr. McCauley about this process and about some of the targets that are outlined in 6.5 and whether these are complementary and this could be perceived as sort of a, a first step toward whatever might be coming potentially with with the next item with 6.5 is, are the, do these work well together? Potentially? Yeah, that's item 6.4. 6.4, is yeah. it 6.4? Yeah. 6. No Pardon me. But y'all know what I'm talking about. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and certainly the motion has created a lot of discussion and some angst among staff. Uh, and not from the intent that is intended, but from the objective stated within it. And so uh, I, I'd like to at least put on the floor for your thoughts that uh, first, the 10% has to be a goal. Uh, in no way can it be an absolute at this point in time uh, because we already know from reductions as mentioned by the province to third parties, uh, which we participate with, there's already an embedded 5% or more increase to our operating budget to pick up the shortfall from what the province has been paying these third parties. That's everything from the housing to to various funds reductions and as well when you factor in the hospital funding allocation we have already committed to and how that will ramp up over the next three years. Uh, we are already behind the eight ball by half the expected amount 
So in reality, from a staff perspective, the stated goal is a 15% reduction if we're to try and get back just out of the gate. The second problem that staff, but, but we support some kind of objective challenge uh, from council if that's what you wish to do. Our standing orders always on budgets are status quo. Do not increase anything in the budget unless absolutely uh, you know, necessary. And that has been the uh, goal of every treasurer that, uh, as long as I've been with the county. So it's always a 0% increase over last year's budget is the goal. Reductions have been attempted twice to my recollection and they've resulted in double digit increases in subsequent years as a result. The second um, concern is the magnitude. We're talking upwards of a number of millions of dollars in reductions. Our operating budget overall is about 38 and a half million. <clears throat> so 10% is about a $3.8 million reduction that's being sought to go the full weight. That's a large reduction and will not be found simply by nibbling the edges. It will be a structural service delivery impact in order to achieve that kind of goal, uh, which gets to item 6.4. And the other, uh, the presentation along mandated services, mandated policies, those are already instructions given to staff to try and prepare the budget along those lines, because I support that kind of a delivery strategy to council. Uh, my experience has been, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the best budget for council to see. But we have a problem in our operating software and trying to deliver that image. Our budget is structured along provincial reporting requirements, which do not lend themselves to a horizontal split along service delivery lines. So trying to present the information uh, is a challenge uh, at best. Uh, so that makes the October deadline a problem. We don't know we can do the service delivery review that is expected to generate the objective and get back to council with either preliminary budget or the uh, any reductions before the end of October because uh, it, the past has demonstrated the end of October is likely the first time where we will actually see the composite budget at a staff level. And normally it would be November where we'd be engaging in iterations through staff because we would be presenting it in the first week of December to council. So if council wants us to go to the, uh, the level of a service delivery review to try and find say substantive savings, then I would suggest to you, and I've talked to the treasurer, that, that the budget will be delivered in January or February of this year, of next year. It cannot meet the December 1st objective if we are substantially going to redesign our budget process at this point of the year. Thank you. But I also, sir, just to add to the questions, I also do hope that council's strategic plan review next month gives guidance on what these strategic priorities are so that we can align our services accordingly. Thank you. Councillor Maynard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're coming. Um, I, I support the intent of this motion. 10% um, may, uh, may be a little aggressive, but what I, what I see it as is a, because it says to explore potential for efficiencies, and this all talks about delivery programs and services to meet the needs of the Prince Edward, Prince Edward County. So I, I don't see this as a, as directing for um, for a reduction in service levels. But I'm not sure exactly what the uh, proponents have have meant. I mean, I mean, just today we we had an item that will increase our level of service that will have a budget impact that we haven't really fully vetted the the implications of. I mean, we every time we add something, there's probably two today that are probably in that in that vein that we're just in the deputations that will increase our our service level. So. Um, I do support an exercise that tries to find as many efficiencies as possible in our existing. And um, the intent, I guess, is to reinvest these savings in strategic priorities. So I don't think it's maybe necessarily intended to be an overall 10% reduction, but maybe some areas where we can reduce so that we can reinvest it. Is that what the intent is, I guess, for um, to reinvest any savings in strategic priorities is that the the intent. So while I, I, I support the concept, I'm just I don't know about the about the numbers, but 
whatever staff can can pull off by October would be appreciated. And Thank maybe you. if I could just I know I'm only supposed to ask questions to staff, yeah. so I'll let well, I'll you, let that. You might speak to that, um, Councillor Hirsch. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I support this initiative. Um, and in discussion with um, Councillor Bullock in advance of this, um, I put forward the idea that the way I see this is a way to say, let's knock 10% off the budget and then see what has to be added back in. Not necessarily that we're, we're aiming for a 10% slice, but get staff to come to us with, well, here's what we could do if we had to have 10% less. And I do like the specificity in this motion, not to just leave things open, but to, mm -hmm. to put it that way. In terms of timing, um, I would agree it'd be useful if we can include our priority setting exercise in the consideration of the budget. I think this is brought forward now to forestall staff going too far in the budget presentation or preparation um, for our consideration in December. If that, if this, carrying this out delays, uh, delays that, I don't have a problem with that. They don't have to do the budget in the first week of December if we want to take it to a month later like we did this year. That works for me. Thank you. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so I'm fully supportive of this because um, the acting CEO made a comment about the 0% um, increase in, in taxes. Well, I don't think anybody's looking for a 0% increase, but they're not wanting another 8% increase. So, you know, if it's the rate of inflation, 2%, the people will live with it. So in no way is this saying we want a zero percent increase because you, you, that just can't happen. <clears throat> and the service delivery, I think it has to be looked at, but you don't have to cut it. I think there's efficiencies there to be um, had, but it just they've just got to be looked at. Um, and I think a lot of the things that we contract out a lot of the um, consultant fees, we have the expertise in-house that can do those. We're paying, uh, I don't know what it is, but I'd like to maybe in the near future have a uh, cost of what we spend a year in consultant fees because there would be a huge saving there if we'd started doing that stuff in-house. And as Councillor Roberts said, that's some of the stuff I think the province is going to be looking at is how are you spending your money? And if we can do it in-house a lot cheaper, then that's a savings error. Councillor Roberts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, to uh, um, our acting CAO's comments, I, I appreciate that, Robert, and I, I think I understand it. But I read the the motion as being aspirational, maybe I misread it, but I read it as being aspirational in terms of a goal. Uh, so I don't have an ingoing concern that we're looking at cutting $4 million out of our budget. Uh, in fact, the language of the motion says, with the aim of, so it's, you know, it's got some, some elasticity there. But I've come back to the notion of prudence and uh, I think this exercise will arm us and equip us uh, because uh, this is a focused effort that will document uh, where uh, and why some of uh, a 10% cut, 15% cut is not possible, perhaps. It'll document the reasons, it'll document the impact, it will as I said earlier, hopefully be related to our strategic direction, our asset management, our priority setting. And I would, I would hope that it would be very, very public so that people understand the consequences. But this is good information for us to share with AMO. It's good information for the mayor and our delegations and, you know, in the relationship with the provincial government to make the case that we've done our homework. Where is yours? Thank you. Councillor Bowley. Thank you. So let's start with what this motion is not. It's not a proposal to cut the budget of the of this 
corporation by 10%. The whole aim is to look at structural and operational efficiencies. So, as some councillors have already said, the, rail, um, the locomotives coming down the tunnel towards us. We got a reprieve this year. Those of us on external boards know that the provincial government is looking at changing funding models. Uh, for instance, the Board of Health is going from a 75-25 to a 70-30. That's going to increase our cost to those boards that we have no control over. So we're going to have to find money and uh, another whopping tax increase next year is not going to fly. Um, so what this is then is not about a cut, it is about a planning exercise. It's to get away from the thought that our acting CAO said that our staff has been used to for the last decade or more of starting with what we did last year and then adding to that. What it is, it's an exercise in categorizing things into those that we must do, things that we should do, and things that are nice to do. Um, and it's an exercise about how we deliver those services. And just because we've done it for 10 years doesn't mean it's the best way or the cheapest way to do it. So it's, it's, a, it's a way of changing the paradigm into let's shake it up a little bit. And any savings we do find, I'm not proposing a tax cut next year or, or a zero tax increase because that's going to kick us in, in the backside in, in two or three years down the road. What it is, is to free up some money to deal with the contingencies we know are going to come and to deal with some of those strategic priorities that we will be examining and setting in a month or so from now. So as far as the, the date, uh, I have some concerns about waiting for a report in December because if that's the first time this council sees that, then we're going to be trying to run from behind and trying to get a budget in place by the 1st of January. So I'd like to see at least the first cut uh, and what, what staff. So if we, if we do it in phases, that's fine with me, but as far as a st the staff's ideas as to where those structural and operational efficiency, efficiencies could be found. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wants to? Mayor Ferguson. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I, I think this is going to be a very worthwhile endeavor. And I, um, I, I think the way this ties with what we're going to hear from um, our acting CAO is a long overdue process. Doing some research into what um, we as a municipality have been undertaking from budgetary considerations from, well, probably since amalgamation between um, what Councillor Bolick and Nyman are, are putting forward and what uh, the acting CAO are, uh, is, is we're going to talk about in due course, is effectively uh, something that's never been done in this municipality. Uh, it could be a game changer. It, it's an opportunity for us to look very, very closely at uh, the revenue sources that we have available to us, to look at our, uh, the services that we operate or the services that we offer to our public and to our visitors, and to take a hard, long look at those and engage the public to determine what they want, what they need, what's important to them. Um, we have debt we have to contend with. We have infrastructure matters that have to be uh, contend with. And I think a long, deep dive into, in terms of what uh, the acting CAO is going to talk about, is the, um, our departmental structure, uh, the the um, the ways in which we can use technology, as we learned this morning, as you can see via the iPads in use, um, that may lead to some of the efficiencies proposed in in uh, what Councillor 
um, Bullock and Nyman are putting forward. So I, I think this examination, this, and it really is an examination, hopefully will lead us to a, an opportunity to better serve our customers more efficiently um, and with more, more impact than perhaps any council prior to this has ever done before. So I, I, I certainly support the entire exercise as outlined in, in uh, Councilor Bolick's Nyman and what um, um, the acting CAO is proposing. As for the timing, um, we've operated the budgets for the, pa and I may be wrong here, some of the longer standing council members may correct me when I say that the budgets um, in, in memory used to come through in maybe March, maybe, maybe February. And that timing um, may coincide with uh, funding coming from the province because they they recognize that um, their funding announcements should coincide with the budget considerations of municipalities. So, if, if this uh, if our budget um, if there's some pliability as to when we sit around and discuss it and and pass it, uh, I'm generally okay with that. But I, I think the exercise is long overdue and well worthwhile the, um, the effort it's going to take by all and the engagement of the public that will be necessary so that they, um, they can contribute and participate in this. Thank you. Are there any other comments from staff? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I. Um, I just want to state that I am not opposed to the direction that I'm hearing and the intent, because I've said to the mayor and others that certainly I believe the municipality should take a more business plan type approach and stop calling it the budget and start calling it business planning and use some of these more, um, more prudent strategic decision making approaches. Uh, we're already moving somewhat in that direction, but as uh, was pointed out in 6.4 where I want to put some money aside to move more strategically in those directions because we certainly are not tooled for a strategic business type of approach to our business to our operations my concern has been around the shortness of the time and the implication that is it leaves us with as a internal examination uh, I'm happy to hear that there is some latitude in the budget itself coming forward if we're able to do some form of examination. And in 6.4, some of the money slated uh, is to do a bottom-up examination of service delivery, including what I believe strongly in is a starting with a consultation of the public. I believe firmly that the public, um, excuse me, does not always understand what services we are required to deliver or choose to deliver and what they cost. And if they were truly faced with that information, they might direct us in other ways. So I'd like to uh, at least move quickly with the item in 6.4, if council agrees, and get some resources in place to start doing the examination of service deliveries. Uh, I trust that staff does all they can to examine their operations, but I believe as a whole, the corporation needs to have its operations examined and decide where and how best to deploy all of our resources. And that may be a structural retooling of the organization, or it may be that there are inefficiencies that technology can help us with. There's certainly low hanging fruit that we can yield, but the 10%, I wanted to just reflect to council on the magnitude of the challenge, and uh, we certainly can rise to the challenge. But if council is prepared to give us some latitude on presenting the budget to you, then we can certainly take steps in moving in a more strategic uh, business-minded examination of that budget. There are challenges in how we will be able to display it to you and how we ourselves can figure out uh, the answers. Uh, a simple example presented to me was road maintenance. The, the road maintenance costs are a, a few lines in our budget and they equal an amount, but no one has looked at that dollar amount in the context of what is necessary, what is obligated, and what is a choice. 
and that will not come from the finance department, that will come from staff and advice from others as to how to slice the dollars into the appropriate columns that the resolution speaks to. I believe it's necessary, but I do believe we need some time to work the mechanics of that out. So if we all understand that as quickly as possible, we bring the budget back, but in the meantime, we report back perhaps in phases on how we're able to examine certain service deliveries, I think we can go forward. Thank you. Did you have something to add? Can I? Certainly. I, just picking up on the, uh, the, the phrase business plan, the, uh, I, I think it's incumbent upon us to present, presenting a bunch of numbers to the, um, uh, to the public per what you said about, about road maintenance is, uh, you know, fine, but I, I think more information in the form of narrative that explains the processes of the departments, how the numbers are arrived at, and how. The, you know, the budget slash business plan presentation coming forward. Councillor Nyman, did you want to have us follow up? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just, I'm just asking this question, maybe to Robert. Then, so do you need a motion to uh, suggest that we bring the budget in January instead of December, or how's that? What are you looking for? I guess, Mr. Chairman, I haven't thought to amendments to the motion directly, but the uh, this, the instructions to come back in October with the full results would need some latitude uh, I, and that if there was an addition to it that simply said council understands that the budget may come forward in early 2020 as a result of the analysis i think would ease some of the concern of timing um, there's some some time required there and and i can further say to the mayor that instructions as far as narratives have gone out already to staff I've sat through many budgets with Councillor Roberts, and I think he's always started the discussion with, tell me the story. Mm -hmm. And that message has been conveyed to staff in the preparing of their budget this year. Can I have a quick follow-up? So, so the October date might be, might be the date where you inform us of progress and that what time at that in the budget will be coming forward based on the work between now and then? Uh, October might be a first uh, That's report what I'm of to. a series of reports on the examinations as opposed to it all being examined and the final document being prepared. Understood. And then uh, on the understanding that that will uh, go through a couple of uh, reports that the budget may be as late as February. Uh, it has been as late as March historically, but I would not want that to be uh, a matter of course. Just when we reach a point, the budget will come forward but it will not likely be the first week of December. So without setting a date, we can have that update in October is what I'm... Yeah. We can begin to have yeah. the updates yeah. in October and perhaps what we would start with is some kind of a uh, hierarchical work plan as to which services do we start to focus on first or we may have already done that and given you some preliminary results and indicate what ones we are still working on. So can I have a quick follow-up on that? Yeah, so I just want to make sure I understand. So, first December, we're not going to be doing budget. We're looking at the first one or two months of 2020. If, if I'm understanding, you're saying a couple phases of this. It's going to be done phases. The first one is October, probably November, December. So we're looking at the first of the year of 2020 to the actual budget. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest strongly yes. We, we have five months to your normal budget cycle. To look at a strategic retooling of our budget approach will take a good chunk of that five months. So I'm suggesting it will fall into January at the earliest. It could be February, but at this point it's difficult to say. We'll refine that in October. Councillor Mater. Thank you. Um, 
on the discussion of the budget because this is a uh, operational overview and um, it is common practice in other municipalities to separate your um, your capital budget from your operating budget and um, I mean part of the reason of moving our budget to an earlier cycle was to try and have our capital budget in place so that we weren't tendering in the middle of the summer you know the, so that we had that uh, that little bit of leg up so I'll ask the uh, acting CAO if that is a um, if that's a strategy that might that we might be able to employ this year that we uh, that be, because really the our capital budget is pretty kind of the foundation of our operational budget anyways that we that we go ahead and still target to do that um, in December and that then we uh, bring forward the operational budget or that we at least separate them I mean that's com that's common practice really what we do is not necessarily common practice I understand the question mr. chairman and uh, I'll begin by saying that people that are going to be doing the examination are the same people that we be putting together the capital budget and they can't do both at the same time although they can try um, and as you pointed out the capital budget is a large part of our operating expenditures so they are interrelated and, and I have expressed the concern that uh, our ability to deliver on our existing demands is difficult if not compromised uh, at the moment and perhaps uh, there has to be an adjustment to our capital priorities this year to allow for some other things uh, to happen uh, that that's a long way of, of saying I cannot confirm to council at this point that December you will have a capital budget it will be intertwined with how the operating budget is delivered and what priorities that are strategic or otherwise that come out of the examination of service delivery an example would be if we found that a strategic cost saving was to affect an amendment to our sidewalk construction program then that would have an impact on your capital budget and that may be a choice the council has to make conversely if council wants to uh, or we want to embark on uh, Wellington infrastructure expansion that will have a significant impact on what the resulting operating budgets are going to be so there is an interplay between the two of them that has to be examined as part of the process. Councillor Forrester. Well, I'd just like to say thank you. I hope you go in this direction and carry on. You know, I've been telling you this for years. For every action, there's a reaction. When you look at this, we don't look at this. So for the first time, I'm hearing the powers above and say, yes, when we look at one thing, we have to look at another thing and the effects of that. So thank you. I hope this moves a whole ahead in this direction it's a long time coming councillor roberts thank you mr chair um and th thank you robert um i strongly support this motion i think it's a good discussion um i, I like the approach which um, is business like um but i want to be personally transparent about where i'm coming from uh, i do not see a the business ideal as a perfect venn diagram overlay with the public ideal uh, so business like is a behavior uh, but it's not an ideal um, in my view uh, the, you know a purely private sector approach is is pretty darwinian uh, it's about delivering goods and services at a profit in an efficient manner for the few and the public sector ideal is about uh, community and civic welfare uh, not it's almost by definition can't be absolutely efficient but it must be effective so just being honest with you about that and okay. through you mr chairman in response to the new councillors I, I certainly understand the difference having worked in both sides uh, it is not a business approach we are not a profit driven corporation but the discipline of a business type approach to budgeting to the expenditure of money the risk consequence equation uh, is one that is uh, necessary and assist council in deciding what trade-offs you're prepared to make in service deliveries and that's the discipline we hope to bring forward and that's what i take from this re this resolution here is the discipline of understanding the risk consequence decision equation in a more disciplined manner and cost benefit ratios Anyone else? Okay. we have a motion 
sorry. So just through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and just for clarification purposes, are we amending the final um, direction to be, and that such efficiency, efficiencies should be reported back to council in phases, with the first report to come forward at the second committee of the whole meeting in October? Are we are we okay with that? Okay. I'm just looking at my uh, my seconder. <laughs> nod or don't nod. <laughs> Yeah, just. Yeah, um, I just want to understand then. So the first phase would be October one. How many phases are are we looking at? I guess is, and then the final date. That's what I want. I guess. Mr. Chairman, I don't at this point know how many phases it would be, but. I, I certainly am hearing you would like to hear the beginnings in October, and it will take as long as it takes, but we don't want to miss our budgeting object or our adopted budget uh, objective of early 2020. Um, so there may be a series of them. There may be, uh, in fact, arguably, there may be a point where we say, okay, continue the analysis, but we must strike a budget at this point, and we're partway through the process. But we, I, until I discuss with staff exactly how we go down this path, because uh, they are admittedly nervous about the redirection at this point in the year, uh, I don't know which ones you'll get in what order and how quickly, but you should get something by the end of October to begin the discussion, and you'll get a series of updates until we can no longer update and have to set the budget, and then it may continue on after that. So that just goes back to my earlier point can we say that we're going to be doing the budget or have the budget meeting in february that way we have the end date so we know when we have to have these phases if the council wants to bookend that end of it i have no objection then i'd like to How? do that uh, does that have to be in the motion or no <laughs> I, my uh, interpretation so far is that that would be set in October, that discussion, based on how far we get. But, and I don't, I think that still allows us the time to, in October, to, de to determine what is left to do in terms of achieving a deadline if we set it as, at February. So can I just comment? Because what I'm hearing is there's gonna be a couple of phases through this process. But what I, and I've learned quite a few years ago, you want a, a deadline, because if not, <laughs> it'll carry on. So I just want to make sure that yeah, we can have these phases, but I want the deadline uh, as February or January, but if February is good, I'm good with that, as long as Councillor Bullock is. Mr. Chairman, picking up on your thread, perhaps waiting till October to set that direction would be prudent at this point. You'll have more information and be better um, better armed to say yes we can take February with what's before us or we might be able to say we can advance it to January but we'll know more when we first report to you in October or give a no later than something like that I don't know that we need to set the date today although we understand the parameter Are you comfortable with that Councillor Nyman <laughs> Councillor Bullock Okay, what we're realistically looking at is a three-month period for the first report or the final report, depending on how this council decides to go ahead. I found, in my experience, that deadlines are wonderful motivators. And then if, if we're going to have an interim report in October, we have to specifically state what is going to be in that report. And we can't just say, give us what you got. Because without a firm deliverable, uh, we probably won't get much because there's always other priorities. So if we're going to phase this, we have to specifically say what's in each phase or give us what you've got at that date and we'll give you further direction at that point. That's my thoughts. Councillor Forrester. You know, I'd like to go back to the defensive here of Commissioner Colley, sort of what they're looking at. And I go back to my 
manufacturing days and I went into a plant once and you look at, okay, I'm in here to fix the problems. Here are all the problems. I'm going to identify the problems and I'm going to attack them one phase at a time because I can't fix everything in one year. But there's main priorities where the huge, biggest cost savings will be. I've identified this as the big, biggest bang for my buck. I haven't forgotten about all these, but where do you want me to concentrate on? Here, 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 here. Start with the big ones, identify them, then move down the line. That is a real business approach to it, on, in office of what you're saying, Bill. But but still, that's how you move ahead from a business standpoint. Identify all the problems and, and come out of phases and say, this is how we're going to attack this, and maybe this is where I'll see our biggest bang. Will it be 10 percent? Well, maybe there's only 3 percent. 3 percent of 20 million dollars is better than 25 percent of 2 million dollars. So. You, from a phasing wise, I, I get it. So that's how I'd want to do it too. I, I think, Councillor Forrester, you're speaking to phasing in the solutions. Well, I'm not he might be. I'm understanding how he wants to bring he's speaking of phasing in the identification of the problems. So, yeah. um, and, and Mr. Chairman, just to add clarity to that, it's it's because of the broad range of services we deliver. As a single tier, we have more than most lower, well, more than the lower tiers. And we have all of the service demands and pressures of, of municipalities much bigger than ourselves. So uh, I, I'd like to at least have the freedom to discuss with my colleagues what we can do quickly and discuss quickly and get some early wins, as it were, and bring that to you in October uh, and not have council at this point start to cherry pick what services it wants to have responded to in October because once we get into it, we may find that challenge is not doable. And I'd rather not fail at delivering something to you in October. I'd rather say, here's what we were successful in identifying. Here are the service we were able to re-engineer. And here's the others that we will continue to work on. Okay, thank you. Was there anyone else? Now we do have amendment to the motion that was read. Um, I'm not sure if you... I don't think anybody brought that amendment. It's, a, it's, it's suggested from the clerk, sorry. It's, it's suggested for clarification purposes for staff to be able to deliver on the ask in the resolution. I have for paragraph five, the last sentence to add a goal of 10%. So that it's not as specific to be exactly 10%, but with a goal of 10%. This is on paragraph five, so clause five. Okay. And then on the final, to read, and that such efficiencies should be reported back to council in phases, with an initial report to come forward at the second committee of the whole meeting in October. Councilor Nyman. This will be my last question or, or comment, but I'd still like to have that end date because listening to Robert is, he has a three months and you have it a little bit more. But the end date, it, it solidifies everything. So you, you know that this is what we're doing. And if we can't get it through, we still have to have something back by this time. I, I get your point. Um, so would adding something of no later than passing the budget, and would that satisfy you? It could, but I'm just saying if, if we, you know, have that date, that gives them the, the I understand. You know, four months or whatever to play with, right? That, that they know they After have October. To, they know that this is when we have to have it done, not, well, we could have it done. We so we're, we're looking at a no later than provision. Yes. I'd, I'd like to... I'd like to put this motion on the floor and get it uh, voted on, but could you comment on that, staff, as, as far as a no later than provision for passing the 2020 budget? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that's the reality, so I have no objection to that. No later than October 2020. Uh, Adopt the budget. 
setting the budget no later, sorry, than uh, February 2020. <laughs> sorry. Order, please. I, sorry, I nearly no, had to call 911. No, no later than no March later 1st, 2020? Is that what you're and, speaking end to? End of February, 1st of March are the same thing, effectively. Well, they are, but you said February, which is has 28. The end, is of a leap year? end of February. Yeah, end of February, okay. So, Madam Clerk, could you just speak to that further amendment then? With the final budget being presented to Council no later than February 2020. End of February. End of February. February 28th, 2020? It's on screen. One day. Okay. February is 29 days. And that, okay. And I told you it was a leap year. We haven't voted on the original, just for um, rules of procedure. We haven't voted on the original motion yet, so this would just be a friendly amendment. So we would only need Bullock and Councillor Nyman to move it. So this is just a friendly amendment, okay? So the last clause to read. And that such efficiencies should be reported back to council in phases, with an initial report to come forward at the second committee of the whole meeting in October, with the final budget being presented no later than end of February 2020. Since I would replace the word should with shall. It's not, it's, it's not a suggestion. Direction. Yes. With that, uh, I can live with that. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Okay. Putting. Item 6.7 aside, we'll move to item 6.1, a report of the Corporate Services Department dated July 25th, 2019, regarding the Duke's Rotary Room gym proposal. Mr. Chair, I'll be excused for Sure. Madam Clerk, I will be leaving. Councillor Forrest is, is leaving the meeting, and so is Councillor Bullock. You may want a break. Two hours in there. You want to have a break? Yeah. Madam Clerk, I think we'll call for a, a recess for 10 minutes and then resume. Thank you. So we will resume at quarter after 3.15. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're moving on to item 6.1, the report. Report of the Corporate Services Department dated July 25th, 2019 regarding the Duke's Rotary Room Gym proposal. Can I have uh, someone move that motion? Councillor Prinzen, seconded by Councillor Harper. Would you like me to read it? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Prinzen Harper motion that the report of the Corporate Services Department dated July 25th, 2019, the Duke's Rotary Room Gym proposal be received and that the dedicated use of the Rotary Room for the operation by the Wellington Dukes Hockey Club of an elite gym available to Duke staff, players, and members of the public not be approved. Any discussion? <coughs> Councillor Harper. Um, I was just gonna maybe ask, the, first ask, I had some comments, I was just gonna ask the staff if they had any updates that wasn't uh, uh, through the chair, we do have a couple of updates, and uh, I'm going to let uh, Lisa address them. Thank you. Through the chair, um, there have been a few updates, and there has actually been a significant amount of communication with the Dukes through this entire process. So the easiest update I have for you is in, you know, I'm always learning about that Wellington and District Community Centre and how it was built. And so through this request, I was able to find out an awful lot about the Rotary Room. And uh, one of those items is the HVAC component to that room, which was just made available this week through our service provider to come in and do an analysis on if that room were to 
to be repurposed for a different type of use. So the current HVAC unit, um, the HR, the HRV component is, is actually just tied in, from, it's a branch from the lobby, which means it doesn't have its own dedicated HVAC component. So um, if it were to be repurposed to be something of a gym nature, we would have to go through the cost of having a similar type unit that we have in all of the dressing rooms to be able to ensure the appropriate air volume, uh, temperature control, and those types of components. And the quotation that we received, which was an estimation of 30 to $50,000, not including ductwork and labor. So that um, that helps substantiate the, substantiate the decision that um, I had made. But I do also want to let you know that through the consultation of reaching out to my neighboring um, colleagues of a gym that's been in Napanee, and also a couple of visits to the Quinney Wellness Center, um, I have learned a lot and one of those uh, things that I've learned is that an elite gym and a community gym are two very different types of gyms and I, uh, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be a gym in Wellington and I'm definitely not saying that the Duke shouldn't have a gym but I do believe in managing expectations and doing something properly and when something just doesn't look like it's going to fit and for the municipality it's going to end up being a bit of a problem at the end of the day we have something that was not really great when there could have been something great down the road. So. Um, um, in, uh, in a meeting yesterday, it does look as though the Duke Sports and Entertainment Group, they also own Rhino Sports and Playland, and that business model has not been um, working to the expectations they have wanted it to, and um, I have been just given some preliminary information that they are starting to turn that facility into um, an elite gym and training facility. I have only pre preliminary information, no details about that, but those are, those are some updates from the report that was submitted. Uh, through the chair, just to add to that, that's information that of course uh, no representative of the Dukes is here to speak to, but it's, uh, it was confirmed with Lisa, I think yesterday, is yes. that correct? Yes. Thank you, Andrew and Lisa. Anyone? I see no others, so. You have the floor. All right, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, I do support the staff report. I, I don't um, know about anybody else, but I, I did, uh, I did do my tour uh, of the facility, and I think that it's a well, a well reasoned argument. It's a good compromise. Uh, some of the things that are being considered uh, uh, as alternatives to the Duke's ask, um, I do see it as a, it's a, it's an asset management decision that we're really talking about, and and I think it needs to take into account, therefore future population growth and I, I do think that um, whilst we all agree that the rotary room is underutilized at this point, if we recognize that the population is going to grow, the, the need for that room I think will only grow and so I think it would be premature to, to give up on that asset, especially when the, um, when the facility was conceived as a community centre as well as a rec centre and I think the loss of the rotary room would, would mess with the integrity of what the building's original intent was. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Roberts. Uh, question to staff. How are our relations at the moment between the county and the Wellington Dukes? And do you detect any risk um, that the Dukes may uh, move? Uh, through the chair, uh, we do not detect. Is it on? I'm sorry. Sorry, through the chair, we don't have any inclination that that would happen. Um, they seem to be very satisfied with the facility at, at present and with the service levels. Um, we have ongoing dealings with them uh, through two other agreements. And uh, if Lisa, do you have any further details to add to that? Through the chair, in a meeting that I had yesterday, um, we are continued to be uh, strong partners in assisting them with some of their events and activities that they have going on. They're, I'm helping them put on their first fun run, a Duke stash, and they are actually trying to have a stronger relationship with some Quinny Red Devils teams and that whole Lady Duke component. We've had to be significant um, assistive uh, members within those arrangements, and so I would say um, you can never say never, but we are strong partners, and I do not see a problem at this time. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Mader. 
Yeah, just briefly, it, it talks about further discussions between Duke staff and um, other arrangement. Is there is there any plan to, if the discussions are ongoing, to bring this back to council with another option, or is it just dead at this time? For the facility? the way it's drafted, um, the the motion is approved or not approved. So we would die in this form into what, as to whether the rotary room would be used as a as an elite gym facility by members of the public and Duke staff and hockey players. But we could entertain um, giving council further information through the chair. Sorry, I forgot that. Okay. Um, as to what the other, more information on the other options that we were, um, th that were discussed in the report. Okay. Oh. You... Through the chair. Uh, through the chair, Councillor Maynard, too. I think what you're asking is, is there potentially going to be a gym proposal come forward in a different manner? Um, so I believe that through the recreation master plan, what the needs of Wellington are, are going to become much clearer. I do believe there is a need, and I believe the need is something that's going to be a little larger than what the rotary room has. And whether the county chooses to become landlords of an expansion to the Wellington District Community Centre, and or if the new golf course or something else in Wellington happens that will bring opportunities forward. I do believe in the near future, Council is going to have to decide that that they approve or do not approve a gym in Wellington at some point in time. I don't think this is um, a dead opportunity, but I do believe at this particular time the re this request in the facility is, um, is final. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just following up on Councillor Maynard's um, question, I have, uh, as you all know, Wellington's uh, uh, a place that's uh, looking at a number of developments and in speaking with one of the developers uh, I mentioned this discussion about gyms and and you know that uh, is something that we might need and they seem more than happy to discuss at some point how they could be part of that thank you okay is there anyone else seeing none we have a Prins and Harper motion on the floor all those in favor opposed that motion is carried. Okay, moving on to item 6.2, report of the Community Development Department dated July 25th, 2019 regarding plastic free PEC request to become project of community interest. Can I have someone put that motion on the floor, please? Councillor McMahon, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Any, any discussion? You want to read that, please? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a McMahon McNaughton motion that the report of the Community Development Department dated July 25th, 2019, regarding plastic free PEC request to become a project community interest be received, and that Council declares plastic free PEC a project of community interest in order to facilitate a partnership with an umbrella organization. Okay, now, does anyone have any? any Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? That motion's carried, thank you. We'll move on to item 6.3, a report of the Community Development Department dated July 25th, 2019 regarding distribution of $20,000 food insecurity funding. Can I have someone make that motion? Councillor Nyman, seconded by Councillor McNaughton. Councillor Nyman, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> that the report of the Community Development Department dated July 25th, 2019 regarding distribution of $20,000 food insecurity funding be received and $20,000 from the Community Grants Operating Budget earmarked for food insecurity initiatives in 2019 be provided to the Food Collective Steering Committee care of the County Foundation. Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I'm kind of, uh, and I'm hoping I didn't read the report right, but I want to make sure I did. So, the $20,000, and um, 
what, what's the twenty thousand dollars going to be used for? Because the way I read that report was to kind of um, put it on social media or, or put it advertisement stuff like that. Is that what it's used for? I'm sorry, so the chair, do you just as a clarification, are you you want to know what the how how it's going to be distributed? as per our report or as per the initial intention uh, of council? Well, I know what the intention of council was, but as per the report, I'm seeing, and I'm just trying to look through here where I found it. Um, you know, it's, uh, there was a, another thing, it, it was some of the, uh, you're going to put it out in advertising about what's available and this and that. What I thought the twenty thousand dollars was for was to put food on people's tables, not to say this program exists to pay for having it advertised on paper and like that. But that's what I was reading in there. Is that what the twenty thousand dollars is going to be used for? Through the chair, it's to, it's to fund uh, the access to food and education and skills. Uh, portions of uh, uh, as part of the food collectives project so there there is some awareness part of it uh, however uh, predominantly it's to increase food volumes at the community uh, through the community gardens program uh, hold cooking sessions at the food banks uh, establish establish self-serve produce uh, shelves at both food banks in Picton and Wellington um, it's to work uh, uh, or develop some surveying around food knowledge and uh, to increase participation at community meals like at the Hope Center. Okay, can I have a quick So, up? Councillor Nyman on page 77, I think uh, staff are speaking to the awareness, access yeah. to food and education and skills components that yeah. are either completed or ongoing and this funding would contribute to those. Does that answer your question? Uh, I just want to make sure that it's not going to bureaucracy more than anything, that it's going to help the people that have the f food insecurity is, is what I'm getting at. I just want to make sure that's happening. But if you go to page 86, I see the budget of this um, from the Rural Ontario Institute, this project, and I just want to know what that's all about too. Like none of that money is going to be used in, in this uh, through the chair no none of the none of the funds that were uh, earmarked uh, through the community grants uh, budget process the twenty thousand uh, dollars are to fund the budget of the rural Ontario Institute project uh, it's in addition to what they have so this is their original application in their budget um, th that's a fully funded program uh, so the coordination, uh, bringing the groups together, uh, those uh, the twenty-nine thousand dollar project has been funded through the grant application that we wrote on behalf of the food collective, and contributions from those community groups. Anyone else want to speak? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried. Okay, we'll move on to item 6.4, a report of the acting CAO dated July 25th, 2019 regarding modernization grant reserves. Does staff have anything to add? And can I get someone to make that motion? Councillor Hirsch, seconded by Councillor Bailey. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Hirsch Bailey motion that the report of the Acting Chief Administrative Officer dated July 25th, 2019, regarding modernization grant reserves be received, that Council directs staff to create a reserve for modernization, and that reserve is solely for the purposes of business and process modernization expenditures. Council directs staff to transfer the $700,000 into a reserve for future business practices, modernization expenditures. Thank you. Any comments? Councillor McNaughton. 
Sorry, I'm still just finding it in my actually antiquated paper notes. So I will find it somewhere, somehow, or maybe I won't. So I, I was left with a number of, ah, oh, there it is. It's covered in pencil. Um, kicking it old school. So I'm, I just, I have a few questions. First, I think it's probably obvious I wanted this item to come before the other item so that we could settle a few questions from that. Um, I, I just wasn't sure based on this report, this report as I described to, I think Councillor Roberts left me feeling like I, the novel ended at page 11 and there's a whole bunch more information that I would love to see about this, including um, the a breakdown of how you perceive A, B, C, D, how potentially the options to accomplish those targets. And I'm also not sure, establish, I realize we're just establishing the reserve right now, but are there things that are actionable right now that we, that you are looking to get started on um, that are going to be coming to us uh, next, very quickly? That, yes. Period. Period. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Question mark. Yes, thank okay. you. Editor, thank you. Thank you. And, and through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes to the last question. Okay. And uh, I, I won't dwell on the service delivery component. I think we've chewed that over enough. But very clearly, I think as Council Roberts had said, the province has indicated cuts are coming. It has provided this money to municipalities to find ways to save costs. And when taking a quick scan of our municipal operations, there are certainly ways to do that if we retool and refocus some of how we do things. And one of the most obvious quick wins, in my opinion, is purchasing and invoicing. Mm -hmm. Apparently, we have purchased software, are having difficulties integrating it, may have to throw it out and buy other software or retool it, but very clearly, going to an e-environment on purchasing requisitions and invoices not only removes staff time and having to manage the paper, but speeds that process up as well. The intent of that software, for example, is that once someone approves the purchase order, they no longer see the paperwork. They no longer have to approve it. They have approved it by virtue of asking for it. So the whole invoice payment is much more streamlined at the finance level. There are checks and balances on the purchase side that are done digitally, and I have worked with this software before, so I know what it is capable of doing. Uh, that's something we can immediately execute. I also understand we have a human resources uh, tracking software that we are having difficulty implementing. Again, it's something that assists us with time tracking, uh, absentee tracking. Uh, there's some break in why we can't use that yet, but it, we already have bought the software, so those are quick wins to this process. The other obvious one to me in item D, for example, is we have an asset management plan. We are going to have other asset management plans, but the question I hear repeatedly from council is, how do I know that the best bang for the dollar is this item over that item? Asset management plans will not give you that answer. They only state the problem. We have to acquire software that will play the what if scenario and we have uh, investigated parts of it, but it is a substantive expense, and this money would assist in providing the uh, what if analysis so that staff can say we can demonstrate the most cost effective expenditure is on this project, and the consequences of that expenditure are this, and if you do it the other way around, this is how, you, how the asset management balance changes. And so answer the other half of the equation. That is easily acquired software and could be integrated within a year or so of getting our asset management plans in place. So there's some quick wins. The longer term will be such things as e-business, and in that I define as if I can use my cell phone to get on an airplane, get through customs, and get home again, how come I can't pay my water bill with it? These kinds of questions. How come I can't file for building permit and get a building permit and pay for that building permit <laughs> through my cell phone? They're simple questions, but we have an infrastructure issue that we have to build to do that. And so that's uh, part of item A, is what I'm calling e-business initiatives. They're very common practices. We have built 
the fiber optic backbone through the main hubs of the community, we should be able to now elevate that into uh, a better environment and thereby free up staff resources, times, or dollars and reallocate them as necessary. So, Yes, follow up. Thanks. Uh, so further to that, further to the e-resources portion, you... And uh, part B <laughs> to my question, further to your comment on D asset management, are you looking at training as part of that component, training for staff so that they can be, um, so that there can be a decentralized approach to asset management that's ongoing? Um, yes, I'm looking at those initiatives. There, there is, um, for a number of years now, there have been uh, e cities within large urban centers. I think Mississauga was one of the leaders, and Brampton is is another one that, that has an e-city. They actually have their interface is digital-based. Um, that's Nirvana, and, and we might get there someday, <laughs> but this is not a one-year uh, approach. The detail will come forward as projects start to get unrolled, and there may have to be some financial money on our own part kicked in for things like training. If it can be accommodated within this budget, then so be it. But for asset management, for example, buying the software and putting it into the environment may use up all of the modernization room that we have allowed it, and the training and using of it, and or the staff that are gonna be in the departments to administer that may have to be our municipal side of the equation and a municipal budget impact. Um, the, that would come forward on an ongoing iterative process, and, and I've explained to uh, IT particularly, but other departments. This is a multi-year approach, but I'd like to see in three years or so that we're at least in the 21st century, if not the 22nd century, of communicating with our customers. And up on funding the hard infrastructure side of it, then I think we take advantage of it and we retool. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Thank you. Through the Chair, Robert. Peter Moyer spoke a couple of months ago about um, software for a roads needs analysis. Could these money be put toward that? Absolutely. And, and the other side of that is what would be called the citywide software, which is common, which is the pick a road and determine what the impact of that decision is over not just your road infrastructure network, but over your total asset base. So the dollar is that you choose to spend isn't just weighted against roads, it's weighted against the roof you have to replace, the truck you have to replace, the arena you have to fix, and, and that is, we've tried it over the last few years, just in an Excel environment, the horsepower is enormous, that's in demand, so the software allows us to look from an asset overall view or to zero in on a specific class of assets. Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to put in a plug for a, a word which I don't see here, but which I'm sure is intended. Um, under item B for the uh, service delivery efficiency, which I assume lines up with the $200,000 um, in the sort of suggested uh, budgeting items, Lean process improvement, which is a favorite of mine. You'll recall I brought this up at budget time, and I would hope that staff, I see the acting CEO is nodding. We even have our lean expert in the audience this afternoon. Isn't that wonderful, mm -hmm. Susan Thomas? Just hope that that's part of this concept, that, and, and that's how we're going to find some of this 10% is through lean process improvement uh, uh, techniques. Thank certainly, you. Mr. Chairman, through you, one of the, I'll say, better service delivery studies that's been recently done uh, and it is a lean service delivery review. I believe it was North Grenville that did it. They have spoken upon it and it is quite impressive. So that is very much on the radar. Thank you. Um, Mayor Ferguson. Thanks, Robert. You, you uh, talked about the uh, e-business infrastructure initiatives. One of these points that is fundamental, fundamental, uh, fundamentally going to assist our residents and businesses in 
the more rural wards who typically would have to come in to Picton to attend to whatever. Am I wrong in that assumption? Uh, no, uh, Your Worship, through the Chair, you're not wrong. Um, part of this monies uh, under that infrastructure, uh, I'll pick an example, may be to create a digital hub in Milford that presents a remote access hub for people in that area to access and communicate with us that way. Uh, because we don't have a fiber optic network there, there's a logistical challenge, but I certainly think we should be able to explore it through key hubs or backbone on th places like our libraries where we already provide our uh, right. web network. Um, but I also want to make the point, uh, just uh, for the public's benefit and nothing else, we're not forgetting the demographic that chooses not to use digital infrastructure. Right. So while we go in this direction, this isn't a total digital direction, unlike uh, the province and some others. We want to have another option for them to engage us, not completely eliminate uh, a no, no, non-digital one. Understood. Understood. But we could, we could make services available in Rossmore, for instance, that, that you know, as a digital hub. Certainly, we have assets in all of our areas, yeah. and, and there's a way to make them a communication hub for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Robert. Um, just an anecdote to support uh, our acting CAO's approach. Um, so, you know, folks know I just came back from Switzerland. So, the little town of Vive, which is only about eighteen thousand people, uh, has a has a digital infrastructure where everything from paying your taxes to making hospital appointments to museum tickets to bus passes can all be done off your smartphone. That's to them old. <laughs> So uh, we're going in the right direction as the acting CEO. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to this? Okay, then we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion's carried. Okay, we're going to move on to item 6.5, Councillor Harper's request for a motion regarding a clear garbage bag program. Can I have a motion? Councillor Harper, seconded by Councillor Bailey. Like that read, Mr. Chairman. Okay, whereas Ontario's Blue Box Recycling Program has been a successful initiative since its inception in the 1980s, Quinney Waste Solutions estimates there's still an unacceptable amount of recyclable materials and hazardous waste ending up in our landfill sites, which is not only adding to the municipal waste disposal cost, it endangers uh, Quinney Waste Services staff handling the garbage, but also needlessly shortens the life expectancy of landfill sites. And whereas in response to these programs, or these problems rather, three other municipalities in the Quinney region, Tweed, Central, Taste, and, uh, Central Hastings and Sterling, have successfully implemented a clear plastic garbage program. You all have one now. That deals with the above noted problems. Research proves clear garbage bags create an obligation with residents to ensure more recycling material are put in the blue bin and hazardous material are dealt with properly. And whereas Quinney Waste Solutions has recently encouraged other member municipalities to consider implementing a clear garbage bag program, it's desirable that Prince Edward County consider such a pilot project. Uh, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of Corporation Prince Edward County direct staff to research the feasibility of implementing a clear garbage bag pilot project in Wellington, including a plan for public education. Thank you. Any discussion? Councillor McNaughton. Couldn't the implementation of this trial be the feasibility study alone? I think that's a question to Mr. Harper. Sir, so, um, couldn't, couldn't the actual implementation of this plan in Wellington as a test area be the feasibility study? I do see it in that regard, yes. I think, I think the, uh, the now therefore we resolve this is to simply say the staff have to have some involvement, but certainly I think it is uh, basically feasible. Sorry. Um, I think that, yes, the pilot project is in fact a feasibility study. Uh, we do need some staff 
input. I have spent a lot of time discussing this with Quinny Waste. They have been through this. They, uh, they and I have talked at length about uh, what needs to be done. I do have a critical path on what needs to be done. The real issue of feasibility simply relates to uh, getting, most importantly, getting the, uh, the retail partners to, to step up to it. We need to do it soon. I'd like to do this um, this fall. I need three months to prepare and two months for the actual test. Uh, so the feasibility really relates to getting the retailers involved. Um, as you can see with your little demo here, it already says clear bags are approved for garbage collection. So I don't think our supplier waste management will be against that, but we do need to talk to them. They are uh, a supplier and have not yet been spoken to, but um, Quinny Waste thinks that uh, there should be no issue. It's really just a matter of them working with them on how they could help us with some pre post measures of success. Thank you for that added information. Is there anyone else that wants to discuss this? Councillor St. Jean. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm not sure who to direct this question to. Maybe it should be properly Councillor Harper. And, and this comes to me from a conversation my wife and I had with regards to clear garbage bags. Uh, and and I, this might be jumping the gun a little bit, but even during your test, I think you're going to find out, find some some uh, issues might get raised. And with regards to if it is only a clear bag that's allowed on the side of the road, and what happens if there's something in there that the the uh, garbage pickup gentleman or whoever happens to be driving the truck truck uh, uh, decides is inappropriate. Okay. I'll use an example, uh, even if it's just simply recycling that shouldn't be in there. Okay. What will happen? Excellent question, <laughs> Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Harper, do and you I have an answer for that. that? Um, so the first thing is that this is a test pilot, so it is voluntary for residents. Should this go forward and become something permanent in the county, then we would uh, look to impose some restrictions on what people do. So the, the municipalities that do it permanently, uh, the, uh, the garbage uh, collectors are instructed to look at visually how much recycling might be in there. And if they feel there's too much, then they don't take it and they put a little green sticker saying it was rejected. What I'm proposing though is a voluntary program. So there is, so residents can choose to participate or not. If they don't put out a clear bag, it's still gonna get picked up. It's just a test pilot. So there is no um, pressure on them, other than I hope moral pressure, to participate in the program, but certainly their garbage will get picked up. That's the kind of thing we would brief the uh, waste management folks on, that it is a voluntary program. I'd be looking for their help to uh, uh, essentially observe and maybe even do some counting of, of, of compliance so that we learn from the test should we decide to go forward with this on a more uh, countywide basis. And did you address the issue of what's in the clear bag as far as the driver or the pickup not wanting to pick it up? All right, well, that would be, that would be one of the things we discussed with them for the, for the test pilot. But I mean, normally right now, if you just put it in the black bag, they're taking it, they're not looking at it, right? So I think if they saw, uh, I think if they saw something that was clearly, let's say hazardous waste material, I think that they're probably, I would ask them to consider leaving it. Uh, because that's certainly a no-no. However, if there was a percentage of recycling in there, um, I think that we would we would still take it because it's a voluntary program, but going forward in a permanent program at a certain percentage of recycling, they would not take it. That would That's how I understand it operates in the three other municipalities. Okay. That, that, that's perfect, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, transparency works here in the council chambers, and I think it would work very well on the curbside. Councillor Maynard. Thank you. So uh, this is a, a question to Councillor Harper. If this is a um, test period, you d you're going to have data from before and then the data after. And the other question is, is because, uh, does Wellington have its own garbage day or is it split with the surrounding area? Because you'd probably want to see what comes in on a day, right, so that they have some idea when they dump it out whether they get more or less. Well, this, oh, yes, this is, this is part of the feasibility, as I said. We, we want to get as much pre-post understanding of how this would work. So, honestly, it is, 
Uh, it's not going to be as quantitative as we would like it to be. It would simply be uh, impossible to do. So from my early uh, examination, our garbage in Wellington is collected along with other wards, so we wouldn't be able to actually weigh it. It's going to be a visual count and or a working with staff uh, of the of the uh, waste management company to to essentially eyeball how it's going. So the first thing is 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 a compliance. So what would be you know what is the percentage of people that are actually using clear bags? That would be the first and most important thing. Are people doing it? And then the other thing that we were uh, we're working with Quinny Waste Solutions is to uh, is to find some unobtrusive ways to 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 understand if the recycling. Uh, is in fact growing because that's the idea is waste diversion away from the garbage bag into the blue box So we're working on what measures are reasonable that aren't going to be onerous for the garbage and recycling people uh, But do give us some numbers and then the final part of the evaluation frankly I think which might be the most important is the post survey that I see us doing with residents to say did you participate? Why why not and if you did what worked what didn't and going forward, do you see yourself being able to and willing to participate? So I think that's going to be the key measure, frankly. Uh, if I could persuade the uh, drivers of waste management with a box of donuts and some Tim's coffee, I might be able to give them a clicker and get them to help me out. But that's the kind of stuff that I want to discuss with them to see what's possible without it being too um, burdensome on the on the guys in the trucks. Thank you, Councillor Prinzen. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First and foremost, I use clear bags at home already, but we leave ours in the garbage can because the amount of times the truck breaks down, the garbage is out there all night and the dogs, the dogs rip the bags open. So ours sits in a bag, or in a clear bag that we use now, and then it goes into the garbage can, it sits by the road until whatever day they show up. So I'm not against clear, clear bags, first and foremost. <laughs> what I am against is in 6.7, which talked earlier, we'd want, we want to cut 10% of our budget and staff work and here we are wanting staff to do another study. So it sounds to me, Councillor Harper, that you've done a lot of the, the legwork already. Is this something that you need from staff to help you with, or are you thinking, being in Wellington all the time, you could probably do this? Uh, I'm, I'm just asking a question. We're, we're trying to cut, cut stuff, and now all of a sudden we want to put, put stuff back on staff. So just a question to Councillor Harper whether you know, you do a drive around the morning before garbage picked up and looked at the clear bags and kind of got an idea until you'd know whether people are picking up on it or not pretty quick, I would think. So just if you could answer that and maybe CAO McCulley wants to uh, respond to it too, that's fine with Council me. Councilor Harper. Thank you, Councilor Um First of all, good for you for using your clear bags. Nice to see. So you're already in compliance. That's great. Um, <laughs> Already discussed with you how to deal with your privacy items. So if you were to fall through, we have a we have not we have a we have an answer for that. If there's certain things you don't want to be seen, your garbage called a privacy bag. So we have an answer for that. Um, in terms of staff time, I I don't actually think I need much staff time at all to be serious on this. It's it's something that Quinny Waste has done. I would be working with them. I do need staff to uh, liaise and coordinate with uh, waste management company, make sure that they're fine and and uh, go through the proper channels there. But I don't really see the staff having to be involved other than um, to, to make that happen. Um, in terms of the, as is also indicated here, which is um, the, um, uh, the education piece, um, I've got some thoughts on that already. Obviously, we'd like Mr. Kerr to put the word out, but I see myself being involved in that. I have a, a team of two volunteers already to help me with uh, the project, and there's a three-month period where we will ramp up in terms of the education side of it so um, I don't see this as a burden on staff um, other than to coordinate um, with that one particular supplier and um, and of course I'd I'd like to get their opinion on some of the uh, the, the pre post measures in the survey I'd like to run that by them but I certainly don't see them doing it I see this uh, frankly I see this as a volunteer project that I'm doing I just happen to be the counselor and I need the staff permission and guidance, but for the most part, I don't see this being a drain on staff whatsoever. Can I have a motion to extend the meeting, please? Councillor Prinzen, moved by Councillor Bailey. Okay, Councillor Roberts, you wanted to speak to this? Oh, all those in favor of, uh, sorry. Yeah, now Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the uh, lighthearted jousting answered part of my question, um, but um, transparency 
We'll put it another way. Privacy is a big issue, um, generally speaking today. So uh, there are discrete products, there are personal consumption patterns, there are personal items for that matter that uh, people might not want other people to know about. Not all of which could, I guess, be easily just put in a bag. Um, so I don't know much about this. I'm learning, Mike. Um, what have other communities done about that concern? I actually uh, wasn't joking. They do have a thing, a concept they call the privacy bag. So inside your clear bag, you would put another bag which would be not see-through, and that would be the, the one you would use for those items. So let's say it's it's baby diapers or, or something that you, you know, or, or maybe you're eating some high fat, high sugar products, Bill, you don't want us to, to know that? Well, you know what, put that in your privacy bag. So the, 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 guy, the, guys, the guys will understand that there's certain things you don't want to be seen. What they're really wanting to make sure of is that it's not loaded up with cans and bottles and most importantly, hazardous material. And so they will make that judgment on the spot and if it looks pretty good, they're going to put it in the truck and if they think you've been a bad boy, well then they're going to leave it and leave a little sticker for you and hope you'll change your behavior the following week. <laughs> Is there a little chapter out of the book 1984 that comes to mind? <laughs> okay, is there any other others that want to add to the discussion? Councillor or, or uh, Maynard. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? That uh, motion's carried. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to item 6.6. .6, Councillor Nyman's request for a motion regarding the intersection of Highway 62 and County Road 1. Can I have someone move that motion? Councillor Nyman, seconded by Councillor Bailey. Oh, Councillor Prinzen? Right on. Okay. Uh, you want me to read it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Whereas uh, Nyman uh, prints in motion. Whereas road safety is a challenge that evolves with growing populations, new technologies, and urban and rural development, and sharing the road with vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists, senior drivers, and driver fitness in light of an aging population and health issues. And whereas traffic incidents at the intersection of Highway 62 and County Road 1 have increased since 2017, and whereas the County of Corporation had, or the Corporation of County of Prince Edward has a goal of moving towards zero fatalities and zero serious injuries and being a leader in keeping the province's roads among the safest in North America by reducing collisions, injuries, and fatalities by working with the Ontario Provincial Police, Police Services Board, Traffic Advisory Committee, and the Ministry of Transportation. Now, there for be it resolved that the Council of the Corporation of County Prince Edward direct applicable staff, the Police Services Board, the Traffic Advisory Committee to work with the province to develop a pilot project focused on mixed mode use, reduced speeds and complementary road design with a mechanism to record and analyze before and after data in the county specifically targeting the intersection of Highway 62 and County Road 1. Can Thank you. Can I speak to that? Yes, Councillor Nyman. Thank you. And we put this motion forward because that seems to be a, a dangerous um, intersection and there seems to be a lot of, um, I guess, near misses there, I, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, I do know that the before the traffic advisory committee right now is uh, speed reduction on County Road uh, 1 um, on the east side of 62 um, and that will help maybe alleviate some of the uh, problems at this intersection but I think working with the province or the MTO I think you know we can come up with uh, a solution there that would uh, make that intersection a lot safer with the design of the, um, and I'm no engineer, but with the design of the uh, intersection now, I was there about a month ago and there was a car 
two cars on 62 that wanted to turn each way and they just didn't know what uh, who who was doing what and that I think some of the problem um, j just from that incident that I seen um, and I think with you know um, uh, one of the things I, I thought you know uh, um, as a common measure for traffic it, it would be a roundabout and, and you know you could uh, with a climate emergency that we declared you know that keeps every the traffic moving slows traffic down it keeps everything going and that's kind of you know it, it's things like that that I think if the municipality and the boards that we've talked about here have some input with the MTO in the province, you know, we might be able to come to some kind of solution for that intersection. Thank you, Councillor Nyman. Mm -hmm. Councillor Prinzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I seconded this motion. I've been to numerous uh, fire calls at this intersection, and a lot of the problem stems from about, I don't know, four kilometers up the road at one and two, they all have a four-way stop. So what happens is they come in down one, and they think the 62 people, if they're not driving too fast, are going to stop and they pull out in front of them. And that happens probably 90% of the, why the accidents happen there. So that's, you know, we haven't had any fatalities there that since I've been on, which is nice, but we are there probably three, four, or five, sometimes six times a year uh, responding. So if we can get something done, that's why I seconded this motion. <clears throat> Councillor Bailey. I think that Councillor, sorry, through the chair, I think Councillor Niner and I were speaking about this earlier, but traffic circle. Hopefully what this brings about is something like a traffic circle because it's one of the smartest ways of calming traffic and as you said, keeping it moving so we're not doing the stop and go that creates that much more pollution. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Councillor Roberts. Uh, I, I support this, this uh, resolution, I think, uh, uh, it's a good um, uh, exercise to go through, and if it's successful, I'd, I'd like to put a little bookmarker in that uh, last council we struggled with how to deal with the intersection of 14 and 62. We even had our head of detachment mention that he had had a close call at that intersection <laughs> um, and tried his best. Anyway, but this is great, and if this works out, let's maybe look at others like 14 and 62. Mayor Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a question to um, our acting CAO. That, um, <clears throat> that intersection is obviously controlled by the MTO. Um, it's my understanding that collision counts and near misses have been communicated to them or to the OPP and they see no problem with the intersection. So we would, as a result, may have our work cut out for us. And our, certainly our current experience with the MTO would lead one to think that it's going to be a um, somewhat arduous process. But do you have any information about the, uh, the, the statistical data? Um, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, not directly all data, I want to say since 2015, all collision data by law has to go to MT MTO and through MTO. The uh, police uh, ceased providing that data to us at that time. Uh, we have, uh, at, to this date, not been able to get that data out of MTO uh, and are unable to get collision data. And we're going through the arduous process of attempting to get it because there are privacy concerns that MTO is guarding against uh, and have made it analogous to parking ticket uh, level of difficulty. Uh, but they have uh, anecdotally in discussions, because this intersection has come up before in dialogue, uh, have said that from their traffic engineering point of view, they do not see any improvements necessary. Both traffic signals and roundabouts were floated in the context with them when we were doing the uh, some p official plan dialogue, and they uh, rejected both opportunities. Uh, we also suggested to them uh, opportunities for widening that area in order to facilitate uh, future roundabouts, and they rejected that opportunity as well. So I think the ministry's position is there's no problem here and we're not doing anything. 
uh, about it, but that may change uh, with this initiative or may change with uh, a lobbying effort from the groups mentioned here. But uh, the latest information we have is that, that they are, they see no problem. Yeah, the only reason I bring this up is, is that this may be a long, a long process to get the MTO to budge. But I, I fully support the, uh, the, the idea of this. Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I live 500 meters east of that intersection and go through it all the time. And it is, uh, just coming to the statistics, there were two rather serious accidents in the last three weeks, mm -hmm. um, one of which took out one of the new light posts that had just been installed. Uh, the lighting at least helps the nighttime situation. I'll, I'll say that. It was a horrible place to make a turn off 62 uh, when it's dark now, but the lights, when the posts are in place, it works. But the problem is that the it is not a 90 degree intersection. It's on an angle. And as Councillor Nyman said, if somebody's turning left off 62, one way onto Highway 1, and the, another person is turning left off 62. No one knows who should go first. And there's this sort of a game of chicken goes on. It's just not right. So I support this idea that, that it needs to be looked at, and maybe there's some statistics, and maybe we can get MTO to, to have another look. Thank you. Certainly worth a try. Councillor Maynard. Yeah, I would. It is worth a try, but I think it's probably a long shot. I mean, there's. Issues all along 62, the, the whole issue in, in Rossmore and the speed limit and 28 and that through that built up area and they were not budging, not one, one iota and that's a, you know, that's a reasonably high or what we think is a reasonably high collision zone. They weren't, uh, they weren't touching that through a built up area, it's 80. You come off that bridge, tromp it and they seem to be fine with it. So it, this, it's worth a try and I think we can maybe, if we're gonna ask, ask for data on a bunch of those uh, intersections at the same time, because either they're gonna say yes to all of them or they're gonna say no to all of them. So it'd be interesting data to have. Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councillor Prinzen brought up a good point that, well, it's not a happy point, but it's a good point that uh, fire, there have been a number of fire calls to that intersection. Uh, and, I, and I know that not every uh, incident there is going to require our services to show up there, but can we not at least glean some of that data from our fire call reports without having to go, like there, it's not gonna cover everything, I get it. I, my guess is if somebody's hurt, first responders are gonna be there. And that's our fire department generally. Mr. Chairman, we, we likely could, but the uh, issue of trying to convince the ministry is based on accident statistics, not ambulance or fire calls. And they, have, they are the keepers of that data and at such time as we are approved to get such data, uh, we'll make the requisite inquiries, but they have so far not been persuaded by our discussions with them. As recently as the new official plan, that question came up uh, about providing for the roundabouts, if not actually providing the roundabouts. And as Councillor Maynard had said, they didn't move one inch. Councillor Harper. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. It's this question for uh, for Robert, just the, the MTO, I'm wondering, you know, when they look at it and they reject it, what time of year were they doing their assessment? I guess I'm thinking of with three quarters of a million to a million visitors in the summer, surely the uh, the, the busyness has got to increase that intersection. And I wonder if they've really taken that into account. Uh, Mr. Chair, that would be something that I wouldn't know because that would be their own analysis, but they use the same uh, traffic analysis templates that we use uh, which forecasts over the year period and they take their own counts, but they don't disclose that information to us. Councillor McMahon. Uh, I, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I'm searching for a bit of a history lesson here. The roundabout that we have at 33 and County Road 1, how did that happen? What? Mr. Chairman, that, if I recall, was the first one in the province and it was after a lobbying effort by the county to do something. It too is not perpendicular. 
Uh, and so the province was moved to at least try a pilot, and that was the pilot. Now it's being repeated all over the province. It seems difficult to get them to agree on other intersections, but they always go back to their traffic engineering and their traffic studies, and they don't, I, I believe it's a combination of we think it's a lot of traffic, they do not, and we think it's a lot of accidents, and they do not, and they have a book they use. So follow up, so it was the, the county that initiated that? I understand it was uh, the prior commissioner's uh, lobbying efforts as much as council's lobbying efforts with the MTO to try something. And so it was uh, conceded as a pilot. So are there lessons that we learned there that we could possibly use one more time again? Absolutely, and uh, that's, I think, the intent of the motion here. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor McMahon. Is there anyone else with any? Okay, seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That motion's passed. Carried. Okay, moving on to item seven, closed session. We have none, so we'll go to eight, adjournment. Wow. Yeah. Councillor Maynard, <laughs> Councillor Bailey. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> Gary. Thank you.